Where am I? There I am. Um, hey, so we finally have Rachel Wilson. I've mentioned her so, so many times because there's been cancellations and there's been, you know, she's a busy, busy woman. So um, I was actually looking her up today to see. Oh, by the way, everybody in the chat, tell me, is my audio better today? I've got the headphones on and now I've got my speaker set up just a little bit better. So I'm hoping my audio should be better than usual. So, um, so yeah, mildly intimidated because I went to look up, um, you know, just some recent interviews with her and to kind of see what's been going on because, you know, you can't keep track of everybody all the time. And uh, yeah, she was on with Pearl yesterday, so that's a channel with like 1.5 million followers. So yesterday she was on that, and today she's on with uh, with the Baron. Five x five, bud. Audio good, says Dr. Crispy Rothschild. So um, I have sent her the link. I'll drop it to her Instagram. I'll drop it here in the chat just in case she's here watching. Um, and she can click it if she's there. So, uh, yeah, on the, um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the farm note, the farm here, uh, dealing with uh, the emasculation of people, right, since that's the topic of the day. Um, God, I left it late for one of my uh, my kid goats to get neutered, so I had to get the vet around to do it. And I can tell you, <laughs> it is a very unpleasant process when the vet gets involved. Poor little fella. Uh, I'm, I think I'm half traumatized from it. But um, yeah, so today we're going to be covering, well, obviously we had our poll, didn't we? And the options were given that maybe the main topic, what, what should I really kind of focus on, um, was the occult origins of feminism. So she has her book. Oh, there we go. Where is it? Occult Feminism, Secret History of Women's Liberation. Um, I recommend going out and getting it. I'll put it up there again so anybody who wants to go out and get it can get it. Um, pretty great book. Uh, very interesting. I kind of came across her when... I can't even remember whose stream it was on, but I came across her one night um, and was just listening to this because I've been sort of... Um, Dealing with issues of feminism, lovely big pair on that goat, unfortunately. Yeah, there was a very big pair. Buzz tried to help me, um, he tried to help me neuter the goat uh, the, the other day, and unfortunately, he was a big fella, and it would not fit the normal way, which I can do, and doesn't cause him much pain, as compared to uh, what the vet had to do today, where I was like holding him in my arms and trying to keep him calm, and he was roaring. Um it was an awful shame to get rid of such a beautiful pair. I feel like this is going in a weird direction now, lads. Going in a weird direction. Yeah, no, where was I? So I've been kind of like, you know, feminism's been one of those trigger issues for me for uh, kind of maybe one of my red pilling issues. Um, because, you know, I think we all grew up in a kind of a feminist environment. Anybody who was born 1980 and beyond, certainly growing up with the, uh, the girl power movement of the 90s and everything, it's something that we were sort of submerged in. Um, so it's something that I kind of railed against early enough because a lot of it I could see just wasn't true. And, um, you know, so I knew all my normal kind of crowdery type, uh, kind of talking points, you know, um, breaking it up into waves and then talking about how long did men actually even have the vote before women got the vote and, you know, kind of breaking down all these kind of historical inaccuracies about how women were treated over the years. But, uh, <laughs> but um, then I came across Rachel's stream and she got into all this extra jam uh, about how, um, you know, where it came from and who funded it and what it's actually, what the aim of it is and the results, results that we don't even talk about in the standard kind of uh, anti-feminist sort of uh, chats that people might have. And uh, yeah, I was just like, wow, this is very interesting. And I wanted to get her on since then, but it's been difficult. It's been difficult. Um, don't tell Mooney I was out neutering goats. Yeah, no one's here. I know, like, obviously, there's a there's probably someone peeking in the window right now. Up a jet there, like, hmm? what are they talking about? Um, but uh, don't tell Mooney. He'll only get angry if he finds out the bus has been neutering again. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm gonna just go over here, click over to my Instagram, and just see. I hope I have that. I hope I hope we haven't gotten our. Uh, 
our time's mixed up and we're not on some kind of daylight savings time um, issues here because that happens sometimes so let's see i'll get over here to instagram and see what's going on children talk amongst yourselves for a moment Ah, okay, she's just getting set up. Big Papa Fabulous took her camera. So she's uh, she's just getting it set up again. Um, so, yeah. So another great thing um, that we should be talking about, hopefully, is just like what's going on in the modern day. I've got some questions I'd like to ask her, separate to the standard questions that she'd get asked. But uh, really, I think most people are going to be just fascinated just to hear uh, her talking about the contents of her book. At any point you're enjoying the stream, obviously like, subscribe, you know, help a guy out. It's not that easy when you're down on these low kind of subscriber numbers to get extra subscribers. Everyone will just throw a subscribe at a, somebody who's got a 1.5 million, but um, no one throws it at the little fellas, you know. Um, and definitely head out, buy the book. It's a bargain. It's a great book. Um, just gonna check what's going on. So, um, yeah, anybody got any questions that they want to ask her? Let me know in the live chat. I'm just kind of waiting for her to turn up now. So, if you've got any questions you want to ask me, and if I want to know about heading head you to goats, I could let you know. Um, yeah, yeah, that one's on my mind. I will ask about that, Buzz, um, because that's a good question. Has she found any? Because I have had some success in the past dealing with uh, a young feminist, but only one. There's a. I've been dropping strawberries. And um, what does that mean, Crispy? You've been dropping strawberries. Um, I had success with a with a girl that was living in my house for a while, a French student, and she was a full. Uh, oh, you've been dropping strawberries in chats. Uh, she was like a full-on feminist and she used to read this uh, this website called Jezebel and she used to uh, boil her cup thing in our pots in the kitchen and whew, all sorts of stuff. But um, um, I just got talking to her. She was actually a very, very logical and intelligent girl and I started talking to her about just like getting into it from a real kind of basic point of view, like the things that she was kind of assuming and even like her own um i don't know what i can say on youtube her own her own stories i started like questioning the details of her stories and she kind of just came around on the whole thing and was like yeah actually i think you're right and she when by the time she left she said she she, she was done with that she'd moved on uh yeah i think everyone's gonna want to know about the witches riding broomsticks so that <laughs> that's a big one and uh, not enough people ask her for a lot of, we want to get into really really deep detail i think about all about the broomsticks um ask rachel i'm wondering does she have any picture <laughs> um ask rachel what she thought about the movie midsummer as you know i don't know anything about tv so if that's a joke i don't get it uh I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I haven't watched any television or anything really, except whatever like YouTube kids shows maybe I put on sometimes for my kids since 2007 or 2008. So I'm totally out of the loop on movies in general. So don't get jokes. It's kind of a, makes me a bit of an outsider sometimes. <laughs> um, you've got a broom like that, Liz? I hope not. So yeah, um, out to deal with that goat today. And you know, these two vets come around and uh, had him kind of locked up. <laughs> Not a jokey stream, come on now. I had him kind of locked up and um, he, you know, brought this these two girls, the vets came around and one of them was kind of training. So the other one was teaching her what to do. And she was saying to me, oh, he might find this a bit uncomfortable. And I was like, okay. She's like, will you just hold him still for me? God, it was like holding an agonized human in my arms. He was just roaring. I nearly started crying. <laughs> I'm too soft for that stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, he got through it anyway. She she 
filled him up with painkillers and he's he's delighted now running around in the field but uh, yeah i won't let that go late again no no um yeah so I'm hmm, just gonna sit here all right let's go over and check what about that canadian lesbian ex-minister for children what was her name she was which too yeah so the, the the idea of the book is that there are, um is that there's this like obviously this is there's a cult roots to feminism clearly that's in the title but um is that it's so tied like it's so completely tied together that it's it's in in some ways it's hard to kind of take them apart because when you look at all of like so much of their like advertising and the messaging that goes into even like not 60s and 70s feminism a lot of it is um and i've looked up, i've looked up more since a lot of it is like there's imagery there like and the, the our side of the internet we're used to seeing imagery you know like you get all this you can kind of overdose on it and you know yeah we had guys on jim bob stream who were given out because he had the what was it two two three or twenty three or I don't even know I'm not I'm not up on that stuff. Obviously, you get all the one eye stuff and you get all the um, everything else. So, oh, what about that Canadian? Oh, the Canadian lesbian minister for children. What was her name? Her name was. Oh, what was her name? I've lost it, but um, yeah, I'm very aware of her. Um, considering my wife was involved with the childcare industry, she was a nightmare. Trying to destroy a, uh, trying to destroy the uh, the the childcare industry over here, and that's a whole agenda all by itself is destroying the child here, the childcare industry. As far as I'm concerned, that's like um, that's like my own little personal grave. No, not grave. My own personal jam is I'm convinced that um, like running a running a childcare business out of your house is like one of those. One of those last jobs that like a, a mother can do and remain a full-time mother right she can kind of do it it's a kind of an empowering job for women a similar thing for men would be maybe being like a trade or some you know like a carpenter or something like that where you you're, you set your own hours you control your own destiny and you control your own prices and um you're not kind of at the behest of a corporation or any kind of company that can force you to be somewhere at any time and i think they are just trying to clamp down on the uh, on the childcare industry for that reason i don't think it's for all the reasons that people think it is i think they just don't want women having that uh that out they want them in the workplace Irene in the chat says current ministers for children is a gay man so yeah we've gone from a lesbian witch to a gay man so that's always interesting we've got great ministers for children over here and rachel's here so i'm going to add her now and uh, whenever she's ready but uh yeah yeah, it's a bad situation over here. Um, so I wonder who I wonder what we get next. Yeah, we've got a very happy man right now, and we had a very happy woman previously. Um. So yeah, yeah. What's her name? I can't even. Maybe I probably, probably shouldn't even say it because then I'll be, I'll be in trouble for something. But yeah, she was. Uh, she was a nightmare. You could remind us, Ivory, in some of the some of the things that she was trying to pass through. Okay, I think Rachel's ready. I'm going to add her in now. Hi, Rachel. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? A bit of trouble. Getting a bit going. of trouble. Yeah. yeah. Your, your camera was stolen. Well, it wasn't stolen, but it was set to the wrong thing. And my camera's down here because Andrew was using it for something. So... You know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay. he fixed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He fixed it. So yeah, when I was uh, when I was watching my stream today, you know, you, I'm, you're kind of always thinking. I was saying to you, you know, it's very easy when you're watching people stream. Like you can watch somebody stream, and I'm sitting there and I'm watching anybody, and I'm like, oh, I can't believe he missed that question. I can't believe he missed that question. And and then when I stream, I'm just like, um. <laughs> so uh, I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about uh all the things we have in common, you know, I was thinking, well, what do we have in common? Well, we're both into homeschooling and um, you've got five kids. I've got four kids and hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll have five kids um, before we're finished. And, uh, you know, we're both into weightlifting. Um, Andrew is yeah. publicly in love with you and secretly in love with me. <laughs> um, 
That's <laughs> and, funny because uh, I always I'm the one who gets accused of simping for him all the time. So, but that's okay <laughs> with me. I, I will gladly simp for BPF, the man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, so actually, I'm um, talking about Andrew won out in the poll, but I think I'm still going to focus on the occult feminism. But uh, that's that's what won in the poll. <laughs> Everybody wants to know about what it's like to be married to Andrew. <laughs> well, we can talk about all that stuff. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you saw the poll, did you? What was there? Yeah. Um, was it uh, homeschooling did terribly? I was, I was, yeah. sort of, I was surprised. I asked that question on my channel too, and homeschooling didn't get a lot and like my few videos I've done in it have not gotten as much traction as you know the feminism stuff or any of the other things I've done really so which is surprising because I always get messages from people saying that's what they want but then yeah. when I do it yeah so I think people who are into homeschooling are probably much more um, they're they're very enthusiastic about homeschooling so they're probably quite loud yeah the size of the market just isn't as big and it's much bigger yeah. over there than it is in Ireland um in, in the US it's like a big thing but in our so all of our textbooks that we use for our kids, well, nearly all of them are American textbooks, because really? there's just so much more homeschooling textbooks. Um, yeah. If, if from in, from America, obviously for the the normal school system, we have our Irish textbooks. So the whole time I have to like translate over into you know into Celsius from Fahrenheit and <laughs> and, and Euro from dollars. Like my my my, my daughter knows like uh, nickels and dimes and quarters, and I didn't know all of these things and now i'm like so she, she can like do everything in nickels and dimes and quarters and i'm like just remember none of these exist for us okay <laughs> <laughs> it's just monopoly money <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah but um yeah so uh, you were on pearl yesterday that must have been exciting yeah uh we actually recorded that interview a couple months ago um and it just she's got she's like the queen of content she's got so much coming down the pipe all the time that it took a long time it was a long interview so they had to do a lot of editing you know they have to make it youtube safe and all those sort of things um but yeah it finally dropped yesterday and it's doing really well and making the rounds and everybody's talking about it so that's exciting yeah i don't know if i'm lucky to be following her or unlucky to be following her <laughs> Um. <laughs> <laughs> that's what everyone says she um. pearl gets a bad rap but she's actually like I've, i talk to her all the time like on the phone and stuff and she's a very very nice girl and um you know people will try to act like oh well but you're more you know you're more academic and you're more this and you're that and i'm like well yeah i'm like how much older than her 17 years older than she is i've already raised a bunch of kids well into adulthood at this point and uh, if you'd have met me at 26 I promise you wouldn't have been impressed at all. So <laughs> um, like, let's just calm down. She's still very young and she kind of just fell into this whole thing like a year ago. So I think if you consider all of that, I think she's handling things pretty well, especially oh. for the heat that she gets. Yeah, she comes up a lot on my um, actually the I, I watched nearly all of her stream with you yesterday in preparation for this today. But um, she comes up in my shorts feed and I've never really subscribed to her or watched her actually. Her interviews are pretty good. I, you know, I probably watch her in future because I've always enjoyed just watching her kind of demolish people in, uh, you know, <laughs> in, in, in the shorts feeds. That's been fun. Which the yeah. same for you. I love watching your uh, your interviews, uh, <laughs> your your uh, your debates on the on the Crucible. Um, yeah, I love debating a lot. It's one of my favorite things to do. I actually really love public speaking too, but I I just love debates. I I'm kind of competitive and. Uh, you know, everybody wants to counter everything I'm saying because most of the stuff I say runs so against everyone's programming of what they think they know. So I'm just constantly met with opposition. And so I get into fight mode all the time and I'm like, debate me, bro. I'm like worse than the worst debate bros sometimes. <laughs> but <laughs> it's because if we get into it, I know that I'm going to I'm basically going to win. You know what I mean? So I'm like, let's get into it. Let's do this. And we'll see like there's probably some person out there who's better at uh, articulating and debating these topics than I am. I just haven't run into that person so far. So like if somebody's out there who thinks they can just crush all of my, you know, arguments and ideas, then I, I want to meet that person. I want to be challenged. So uh, yeah. I think debating's a lot of fun and I know that's not super normal for a woman, but that's okay. Yeah. And so like, the problem with debating, obviously, and I think actually you articulated this or somebody articulated this on during a debate in the Crucible, which was uh, that you're never really trying to convince, or Jim Bob said it, I think, you're never really trying to convince the person that you're debating. 
you're more trying to convince the audience, right? Yeah. Yep. You're trying to demonstrate. And I always say, like, when you first start debating, what you were talking about earlier, where you're watching somebody and you're thinking, oh, I would say this or I would ask that. It's the same thing with live debates. People will watch them a bunch and they'll be like, oh, I could do that. I could kill that. You know, I I'll, I would get on there and I would do this and I would say that. And then the, the camera comes on and they get put to the question and they're like, uh, mm, I forgot what I was going to say. It's a lot harder than it looks. But what you're trying to do is keep your opponent on the defense. I think the biggest mistake people make when they start debating is to the idea that they're defending their position, right? Oh, I can defend my ideas. And you should in all of that, but really you should be destroying your opponent's position first, and then your ideas look great by comparison anyway, but then then you can defend your ideas. But it's a mistake to try to just defend and let the other person just question the crap out of you for like an hour and a half. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's just yeah. going to show any little flaw you have, so... Um, yeah. But yeah, you're trying to sway the audience, not necessarily like I don't really care if the person I debate ends up agreeing with me or not. That's happened a bunch. But I mean, then you have Nina, who's gotten crushed by both me and Andrew and still continues to say the same stupid <laughs> things. So, I mean, but Nina's at least entertaining in a, in a way. You know what I mean? I know she irritates the crap out of people, but she's kind of fun to debate because she is such a stereotype of the modern woman. You know what I mean? She's such a, like an avatar of modernity and modern females. Cause she just says stuff like whenever my guy and like, mm, what do you mean? Oh, yeah. What do you mean? Uh, it's just like, uh, she, she doesn't feel like she needs to justify anything. She just thinks everything's obvious. So it's just, those kind of debates are fun. Uh, Cause they're kind of like, when you'd go to a Gallagher show back in the day and just watch him smash watermelons, kind of like that, but verbally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's almost like that kind of that kind of hot girl energy that works in a pub, where when when some guy is like arguing something, you can just go, "Oh, you're an interesting guy," and then that's like the end, like you know, right? You just, <laughs> and so she she tries that in, um, while on the crucible against you, and it's kind of, it just it does come across very funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, but the question I had then was. Um, so obviously you do that, but when you're trying to convince people in real life, so it's not really a debate, have you ever had any success with that or do you have any different way of approaching the topic? Yeah, I'm a lot nicer. If I'm not in debate mode, I'm definitely more gentle and I usually kind of just ask the person questions to kind of pick away at their presuppositions because the whole deal with talking about women's liberation and femininity and gender roles, all these kind of things is that we've had a hundred years of some of the most intensive social programming the world has ever seen. And everybody, even those of us who consider ourselves like unwoke from this stuff, all of us have a lot of layers of programming to dig through before we can really think about these things um, critically. So I'll usually just kind of start by asking them, you know, well, what do you think about this? And do you think this is true? And kind of picking away at that and at least get them to, you can see their face kind of start to go, well, well, I don't know. I, I guess I haven't thought of it or I didn't think of that that way before. And it starts to get them to question like, hmm, maybe I don't have this all figured out. And then I can give them some information because I can be a little overwhelming with when I get going with my machine gun of facts and mm -hmm. um, statistics and historical stuff. So I try not to <laughs> try not to just come at people with a wall of that um, because that can just overwhelm them. And they're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Um, but yeah, we've had uh, we've had a couple of times where people have wanted me to like in person red pill their family or their friends. And it does put me on the spot a little bit. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm going to be the bad guy now forever. But better me than my friend, right? So like uh, Zen Shapiro uh, talks about this a lot where we went down to visit him. He's the co-host of The Crucible, if you guys didn't know. Uh, we went down to visit him and his family for their baptism. And his mother and his aunt were there. And they're like boomer era ladies who are divorced and now single and alone and um, you know, he was like, oh, this is my friend, Rachel. This is her book. Have fun. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you should talk to her. Um, and I sat there and talked with him for a good couple of hours and I don't know how much it broke through or anything, but yeah, it was like a whole kind of me walking them through 
their presuppositions and getting them to question stuff. You know, like the very first thing people will say is like, well, but what do we do about bad men? What about abusive men? And I'm like, well, first of all, do, how big do you think the abusive man problem is, right? Like how, how many marriages do you think end in divorce because the man is just beating the woman up on the regular and they'll, they'll always overestimate it. So then I'll counter it with just like some basic statistics of how, how extremely rare that is. Uh, there's been a lot of stats misrepresented on that topic for decades now. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually working on a project where I'm going back to the seventies and debunking a lot of their phony baloney stats and claims that women's lib groups came up with back then where they would skew and torture the data to make it sound like something it's not. Um, and then after we established that like that's pretty rare and the vast majority of divorces are not only initiated by the woman, but for reasons such as I was feeling uh, I was feeling like it was holding me back to be married and have kids or it was holding me back in my career or I needed to find myself or I had to go on a self discovery journey. Like it's always <laughs> this nonsense, vague, like, I was unhappy. You know, I yeah. was unhappy. So what to do? Get a divorce. And then I'm like, what's the first thing that every woman you've ever known who's gotten a divorce does? They get a divorce. And what do they do? Go to the gym, lose a bunch of weight, go on a self-improvement journey, uh, yeah. you know, like fix themselves after the divorce. And I'm like, if you'd have done that while you were married. Yeah probably wouldn't have had to get a divorce because <laughs> but, what you're saying is the problem was with you all along. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. when you were married, it was him that needed to do the improving. But now that you're divorced and you want to be in the market for a new guy, now you're going to improve yourself. Right. So I'll just kind of like walk them through these things and ask them, like, does any of this sound like you maybe do? You, do you feel like you can relate to like what I'm saying? And they'll kind of be like, yeah. And then they'll have more objections and we just kind of work through it. So I'm I'm a little nicer and try to be more gracious and patient when I'm just talking to people in a conversation because I, I do understand that everything I'm saying sounds crazy, right? F at at yeah. least at first, when it hits the ear, it's just like, what? And people will think I'm nuts or um, that I have some kind of agenda or there's a grift going or like, a, I'm a pick me girl. I just want all the men's approval or like, I've been married forever to the same guy. Like, why would... I at 42 suddenly decide I want male approval, like randomly online. It's very weird, but yeah, it's a different approach if I'm not debating, but if I'm debating, I'm pretty ruthless. So I, I don't yeah. hold back. Um, slow boy just said Rachel went from a million sub channel to 20 in a chat. We love her. And then the, cru <laughs> the crucible limited says that's because she thought he was a real baron. I had to break the news this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, the crucible limit also says I beat my woman on the regular and I'm still not divorced. <laughs> so. You gotta try harder, you gotta try <laughs> yeah. har harder, buddy. You gotta work on that. Yeah, on that, that topic, they have I'm, I'm sure maybe you've come across this woman, but there wasn't there a woman in the UK called Irene something who had these early um men's shelters, I think, or women's shelters. I think she started off raising money for women's shelters in maybe the 60s and 70s in London. And what she discovered, she started coming out and saying what that what she discovered is all the women who they had to take into these battered women's shelters were all violent. I, um, I haven't heard that, but that sounds fascinating. Yeah. And then she changed. So she was like a kind of a hero of the kind of the feminists and so on. At that time, she was setting up these things. And then she started making men's homes. She was the first person to make these battered men's homes. And uh, she was saying things which then got her depersoned because at the time she was saying, actually, a lot of like there's there's a there's, there's a personality type often. I'm not saying always, but often that ends up in these relationships. And usually yes. they're both violent. Yes, and, that's uh, what personally, that's what I've seen in my own life, like in my own experience with people that I know. It's usually a situation where it's people that have issues and they're codependent and they get into these really unhealthy relationships where fighting and like the domestic battery stuff is like their norm and there's usually like substance abuse problems that go with it and all of that sort of stuff but yeah it's very very rarely and i have a bunch of stats about this 
but it's really, really rare that you're just in a marriage, the marriage is fine, and then suddenly one day the man just becomes a different person and starts beating the woman. I won't, I mean, there's always an exception, right? And and Pearl gets this right. This is one thing she says that I completely agree with. People won't address what we actually say. They only want to talk about the outlying, so the, but what about this exception? Or what about this possibility? And it's like, yeah, well, look what happens when you make the laws and the norms around the exceptions, right? We, <laughs> that's what we've done. Yeah. That's, that's why feminism is so bad. It's because we basically took outlier situations and built an entire legal system around dealing with some outlier situation that didn't need the whole system built on it. So for people to just always come at us with, but what about this exception? And what about in this rare circumstance that could potentially happen? It's like, yeah, but that's just not what we see. And I think you're right. It's like, um, I have family members who are women who are violent, who have been to jail for domestic assault, who have done, you know, uh, they get like probation time or things like that, get driving privileges taken away, uh, get fined and stuff. And it has to get pretty bad usually before the woman's going to see like legal repercussions from something yeah. like that. But I've seen it in a few cases of people close to me where. It... And then, of course, the woman will say she'll say, oh, he he pushed me. And then you talk to the guy and you say, what happened? Did you push her? He says, yeah, I pushed her because she was attacking me with like a broken piece of glass, right? She's trying to like <laughs> slash my face with it. So I had to push her away. And then he gets in trouble for, for abuse, you know? So it's, there's usually more to it than just some man was mercilessly walloping on his wife. But, but that's, it's surprising how much people think that that was the norm for all of history. I've had yes. so many people say this to me. They're like, oh, you want to go back to the time when men could just grape and beat their wives and, and everybody thought it was fine. And I'm like, that literally never existed. That yeah, wasn't yeah, a yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, if you are in an abusive situation now, who is it that you call? Do you call feminists? Like if you're if your husband is abusing you, do you call ladies to come and save you? No, you call policemen, you call firemen, you call other men, you call your dad, you call your brother. You're always going to appeal to good men to stop bad men. So why create a system that punishes all men as if they are all bad? And then the men are still the ones that enforce, you know, those laws. So it just doesn't make any sense when you actually start to challenge people on it. What strikes me about that, that whole sort of the way our the way we do that, we try and create these rules that go that you know, we rule for the exceptions. That is almost how I envisage the the difference in how generally as a group, I feel like you always have to say that, women and men operate. Men are we always want to kind of have these kind of broad general rules that work. And women are built for dealing with the household. And sometimes the rules aren't the same for the oldest child as they are for the middle child as they are for the youngest child. And that's what women are. Yeah. So that's what women's brains are always doing. They're making this kind of complicated set of rules that work, right? Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um and I think that so like when we talk about women being more built for egalitarianism and fairness and stuff, that's what you would want if you have five kids, right? You want all the children to be fed equally. You don't want the best performing child getting the most food, right? Like that would probably be bad. So you, it's good that women are the way they are, but it's bad when you take that and then put women in charge of like society at large or, or spheres that they, they're making rules for things they can't defend and stuff like that. So just because women are and another common thing, if I say men build and maintain modern society, this camera that I had to have my husband come help me with the camera. It's not because I'm stupid, obviously. I mean, I have mm -hmm. a reputation for not being stupid, but yeah. he's far better with technical stuff. He's a mechanical engineer. He's really good with like machinery and equipment and things. And I'm a lot better with like concepts and research and abstracts and stuff like that. But that doesn't mean I'm better than him or more capable than him or that I don't need him. And men built all the stuff around us that makes women think they can do these things. So I'll point that out and I'll be met with, but women are good at stuff too. And I'm like, yes, I said that. I understand. Women are great at lots of things. They contribute in wonderful ways. Yeah. I don't hate women. I'm saying we're different. And I'm saying that 
modern technology gives women this silly illusion that we just don't need men now. Like men are just obsolete. We don't need them for anything. And I'm like, when the power goes out, even for like a few hours, you find out that that's not true, right? Do you think yeah. women would want to live in a society uh, where they woke up one day and an EMP had hit, right? An EMP just wipes out everything, wipes out cell communications, electricity, anything powered is just dead in the water. And the men have disappeared. They've been raptured into the heavens. Like God had enough feminism and he just raptured the men out of here and said, all right, women deal with it yourself. You know, like suddenly there would be no more feminism. It would be gone that fast yep. in a situation like that. So, and yes, we do have the modern technology and no, it's probably not going to happen just like that. But we do see civilizations collapse. We do see disasters. We do see war. And in those times, historically, you see feminism just kind of go away for like years or decades sometimes. A good example would be you had the Roaring Twenties, right? With That was kind of the first sexual revolution with flappers and um, women having short hair and short skirts and smoking and drinking and partying with the men. And uh, we had just gotten our first few forms of birth control. So there's a lot more out of wedlock sex happening all of a sudden. There's a lot of Skittles stuff happening, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of Skittles liberation happening in the 20s and 30s in the West. We're talking places like Berlin, Chicago, New York, LA, San Francisco. It was a big thing. And then suddenly, oh, you got it. <laughs> I think my wife, just speaking of uh, equality, I think my wife's out mowing the grass. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Shame on you. Just kidding. Totally teasing. There we go. And you can hear my dog barking, I think, can you? A little bit, but it's not bad. It's not too he just bad. sounds like Toto off in the distance. Oh, now he's quiet. Yeah. But yeah, he's I mean, you, you see this happen historically where we have a bunch of liberation and then like a major war breaks out, right? And then that stuff kind of goes away for a couple decades because people remember what's real and what's normal and that you know, all the, all the technological advancement stuff is kind of an illusion. You can't depend on that and start acting like, well, now we don't need men. We can just have this like utopian Amazon society where women just run everything. And by the way, if you've ever looked at any of the statistics about how women abuse power, about how often women abuse their authority, like I was just looking up some stuff on this the other day. And uh, like people think prison grape is a male problem. But actually, this shocked me. In juvenile facilities, the victims of SA are primarily victims of women. So if you are SA'd in a juvenile facility, your perpetrator is nine out of 10 times going to be a woman, which just blew my mind. But women abuse power plenty. We see this all the time with like the high school teachers that end up with some 14-year-old boy, right? And uh, yeah. they get a slap on the wrist or something. So this idea that like only men would abuse power and authority is laughable. Women abuse power and authority all the time. Yeah, yeah, it's bizarre. And that's the messaging we get. I think people are so subject to messaging like that the whole time in the media and every other way. And that's what you were tipping on earlier when you were talking about um, Baron, the Baron pretending it's not one of his Bulgarians cutting the grass. It's not a Bulgarian. <laughs> <laughs> it's an Albanian, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah like that people believe this idea of like every woman in history was um just constantly raped and beaten by her husband and tied to the sink and that they were all just dying to escape the terrible situation they found themselves in it there's a smell of it like as if have you never had a a, a decent man in your life at all and i think you need to almost be living in like maybe a big city with a lot of like effeminate men surrounding you because I don't understand how, like, you could have a father or or you could have a husband and still remain a feminist and still be kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, my husband, if this was 100 years ago, he'd have just been raping me and beating me every day. And you're kind of like, really? That's what you think? Yeah, it's, it's insane. It would be to believe that most men uh, in their hearts want to abuse their mothers, their sisters, their daughters. You yeah. know, the, the nice ladies at church, like they're just waiting. But there are feminists who who believe that and they wrote about it a lot. Like Andrea Dworkin would be one. Uh, Shulamith Firestone, the 60s and 70s especially, was filled with like 
feminist separatists who were extremely radical and they would write feminist theory that was like, they would take the most mundane daily situation and say, see, this is actually great. You just didn't ever realize it, that, that just a man saying this to you or just a man going about his business, he's actually oppressing you. That's where like that stuff kind of came from. And I think that's why women started to see everything a man does and his very existence as like abusive. And it's true that men have the monopoly on force. That's always going to be true. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I'm like, a, am very strong for a girl, but I'm not stronger than the vast majority of men. And, uh, you know, if it was a hand to hand situation, I'm not going to win. That's true. But that doesn't mean that men just walk around all day going, just uh, where's a woman? Just let me at her so I can teach her a lesson <laughs> and prove my dominance. It's like, it's so silly. And they, but women walk around with this idea in their heads that men are just waiting to do that. They're just yeah. waiting for an opportunity. And it's, it does fly in the face of reason and experience. And I agree that I think there is a bit of a dichotomy. Like people will kind of ask, like, how did you come to all this, Rach? Like what? What made you come to this? Well, one thing is I did experience a lot. It's not that I haven't experienced a, a bad relationship. I was an, abuse, an abusive relationship, an actual one, not one of these. He he told me no once, and so I was abused. <laughs> um, I, I was with a guy when I was in my early 20s who uh, had a drug problem that I didn't know about. And okay. once I start, yeah, it, like I found out via the abuse started seemingly out of nowhere with other weird behavior. So... But I mean, that I still don't think that's all men. I still didn't walk away from that experience thinking, oh, this is how men are and they're all going to do this. It was like, no, this is a person that had specific issues and problems that I didn't know about. Um, but in my life, I've seen women do horrible things and destroy entire families and tear people apart from each other. Um, I've seen women close to me lie about the paternity of one of their children and let them go their whole life thinking someone else is their dad and like no one's allowed to say anything about it. That kind of stuff. Shocking. Well, meanwhile, like the men around me as I grew up were not that way. Do you know what I mean? They generally had accountability and they were responsible. And if they did screw up, it was like, ah, I screwed up. Whereas I noticed that women, it's like they, they physically cannot admit wrongdoing. It's like women have this thing where they can't say I screwed up. I was wrong. I need to improve this about myself. Like I'm, I'm out of control or my behavior here is bad or I treated someone wrong. It's like women have a, a barrier and I think it's trained into them because what do you hear all the time? Like all the women's self-help garbage is always like, you're the best. You're a queen. You're amazing. Just the way you are. You don't need to change anything. The man should change or the world should change. Right society should change. It's not that you're fat. It's that people are evil. And uh, there's men have beauty standards that are uh, unrealistic. So it's not you. It's the world. It's everyone else but you. So I think a lot of women end up completely incapable of admitting when they're wrong or improving themselves. And that's not good for women. I mean, it's terrible for everyone around them who has to deal with them too, but it's certainly not good for women. That's how you have Lizzo. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, girl, you're going to die. You should probably <laughs> uh, get your health under control. But she's on like a social justice campaign to be a victim and like a martyr for this movement, this fat acceptance movement. So I just think women get programmed with nonsense. They it, it makes it very easy for them to always think that they're right and it can't be anyone else. And nobody wants to give that up, especially the older you get. So imagine you are in your 40s or your 50s, and this is how you've lived your life, and then you read my book, and I've gotten tons of emails, uh, letters in the mail, DMs from older women saying, I'm reading your book right now, and I'm just crying my eyes out. Like, I can't even see the page anymore because I'm sobbing because I've ruined everything, and I can't go back, and I can't fix it. Yeah, you know, my whole, my whole life is a mess, and so Honestly, that's hard to read all the time. It makes me really sad. And I, I want to get to people before they hit 60 and go, oh, my God, I, I did everything wrong. And, and now I've got to try at 60 to somehow pick up the pieces. That's really tough. So. Yeah, yeah.
Yeah, it sounds like almost, uh, not to labor a term, but it sounds almost like a virtue signal when you say that to people. You say, no, this is damaging to women. This is more damaging to women than it is to men. Like, it's yeah. really annoying for men, and it's a real problem, but it's way more damaging to women. And so when, like, you know, I've had people question, like, because I've got three daughters, I don't have a very good stance with feminism, and, you know, they, the, they're like, well, you know, they're going to come up against these problems and these problems and all these terrible things that happen to women. And I'm just like, I don't think it's in their best interest to feed them the nonsense that you want me to feed them. Like, yeah. You know, and um, it's very hard to explain that to people because they just think you're, you've you got your own male agenda going on. And like, how, yeah. do you get around, how do you get around that? Well, for me, that's one of the reasons I do this. So <laughs> it was funny. <clears throat> maybe two years, two or three years ago, our youngest one started to be like really independent. The oldest one had just graduated. The second oldest was about to graduate. And I'm like, oh man, I'm, I'm heading into the sunset years of raising kids. And it, it does come fast. Everybody says that. And you, you kind of laugh to yourself because you're in the earlier sleep deprived phases where you feel like <laughs> you're never going to sleep again in your life. But then you do really wake up one day and you're like, oh, like, like my youngest is going to be out of here in six and a half years. That's not that long. I've already been doing this for 22 years, raising kids. So I'm like, Oh, I'm kind of, kind of heading towards the end and like could be having grandkids anytime in the next couple of years here. So I'd need to start thinking about the second half of my life. And what am I going to do when my days are no longer filled with homeschooling and laundry and dishes and, and all the things that you do as a full-time mom with a big family. And I asked Andrew, I'm like, I should probably start building towards something like I know I want to volunteer. I know I want to be much more involved with the church, which I am now. Um, but, you know, I do have a lot of talents and things I could do. Like, what what do you think? Like, what do you think I should do? And he's like, you know, you're really good with the feminism stuff and explaining things in a way that I think people can understand. And you have so much background knowledge on it from just your own curiosity. And he's like, there's not very many women who who can do that and who are willing to. Because let me tell you, uh, I get a lot of hate mail and I get a lot of pushback and a lot of vitriol from people. And most women are not willing to deal with that kind of like social pressure and, um, you know, everybody pushing back and going, but what about men? But what about men? It's, it's tough. So there's not very many women who want to do it. And he's like, you're kind of uniquely suited to, to do something like that. So maybe you should do something with that. And that's where the book came from. I was like, yeah, maybe I'll put it all down in a book, you know, like kind of just make a case for where all this came from and how we got here and stuff. And maybe, maybe no one will ever read it. And originally I thought only my daughters would, cause I have four daughters. So I thought eh, someday when mom is gone, maybe they or my grandkids will like pick up the book and read it and understand where I was coming from and why I was, you know, different than the other moms and didn't agree with them on all this stuff. And that's kind of where it came from. And now it's it's done so well and so many people have read it. And I'm shocked. I'm like shocked every day at how many people have actually bought and read the book. It's crazy to me because I didn't know if anybody would ever read it. I didn't have an editor. I didn't have a proofreader. I didn't have a publisher. I just wrote the dang thing and put it up on Amazon. And it still has like a couple typos in it and everything. So, but it's done so well. So apparently people do want to know the truth. You know, it's just that they don't want everyone else knowing that they want to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's I I mean, I'm just the kind of person that I just say, look, I know that you're going to think this is crazy, but this is what I think. And I, I've been doing that forever. So when I pulled my kids out of public school and started homeschooling them, that was highly controversial. You know, like poor Andrew, like his whole family, all the women in his family are always a little bit kind of like, mm. Rachel's little cuckoo, but whatever, whatever you, you know, if you like her, Andrew, that's what, they're very nice to me. I'm not even trying to, they're just more like, why can't you be normal? <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And even, even my dad at times has been like, oh, you're just so extreme on some things. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to follow the CDC pokey schedule for my kids because I think it's nuts. Yeah. You know, I, I research everything and I read like, I'm like, why do they want me giving my kids hepatitis vaccines, you know, and stuff like that? And I'm reading about it and I'm like, okay, so the risk to my children of getting this disease is pretty much zero, but the risk of side effects is certainly not zero. So I'm just like doing my research, weighing things because this is my job. 
Yeah. I took it very seriously. If somebody's going to be injecting my kids with something, that's my responsibility to know what that's what that is and all those sort of things. And I didn't, you know, I didn't want to do that. And the school threatened me and they sent lawyers and everything. They were threatening to, um, you know, sue me if I didn't send them and all this stuff. So I looked up homeschooling laws and I thought I could probably do better myself anyway. It's not like they're learning crap. You know, like at that point, I was already feeling like they weren't learning anything and weren't where they could be anyway. I was like, you're there for seven hours a day. And I'm not sure what exactly you're getting out of this, except for, you know, how to make a diorama, which who's ever going to need, who's ever going to need to make a diorama? What any of you in the audience ever make a diorama as an adult? Did you like, feel like all those <laughs> projects you did in school ever helped? I just thought it was silly. So I was like, why not? I know it's not what everyone else is doing, but I'll pull them out and I'll teach them stuff, you know, and I'll, we'll, We'll eat healthy food. We'll practice good hygiene. We'll exercise. We'll get sunshine. Uh, yeah. And my kids will be healthy. And they were. They really were. Um, so I'm just kind of used to always going against the grain and doing what I think is best. Because at the end of the day, I'm responsible. I have to be the person that has to tell my kids why I did what I did. And when they were younger, they thought I was a little kooky sometimes. They'd be like, why can't I just have a normal mom <laughs> from time <laughs> to time? You know, when they're in their teenage years and I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going against, like their friends' moms are partying with them. You know what I mean? They have friends who the mom is like a single mom and she's like wanting to drink with the teenagers and have a bonfire on a Saturday night. And I'm just like, no, yeah. no, we won't be doing that. And they're like, why can't I have a normal mom? But now that they're in their 20s, my two oldest... They both pretty regularly tell me like, thank God that you, <laughs> thank God you were weird and didn't do everything like the other moms. Like it really turned out better for me. And now I'm really thankful that you and, and dad. The other moms are the weird ones. Right? That's, That's what the I funny think. thing. Yeah. yeah they, are, they are the weird ones. And like um, that can end very badly. And I'm sure it does for lots of people where those single moms by the bonfire do something with a bit of alcohol in themselves that, uh, you know, there's a lot of guys out there who probably really wished they had the kind of mom who didn't want to get drunk by the bonfire with their 18 year old friends. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh um, yeah. That's uh that's actually, there have been some stories like that around here where stuff like that has happened or just like uh, my 22 year old was out with a group of girlfriends. Um, I think it was like a, maybe a bachelorette weekend or something. And she's like, I thought we were just going to brunch. I thought how much trouble, like she didn't want to go to the main party. Cause she's like, I know they're going to have like penis suckers and penis everything. And they're going to get wasted and probably embarrass me. So she didn't want to do that, but she thought I, what, how much, how bad could brunch be? Right. I'll go to brunch. That should be pretty tame. And she's texting me from the brunch. Mom, all my friends are getting drunk and acting silly and stupid and they're embarrassing and they're rude and they're loud. She's like, I'm just, I just wanted to text you to say thanks for not raising me to be like that because it's em embarrassing and I'm glad I'm not one of those girls. <laughs> yeah, so. That's great. So the, I'm for everybody who asks, yes, when your kids are growing up and they're in their teenage years, they might think you're a little strict or want you to be like other parents, but they do, at least in my experience, they appreciate it when they get older. They're kind of like, whew, dodged a bullet with some of that. <laughs> um. So, yeah, one of the typos that I noticed in your book is that you seem to have implied that feminism didn't start with suffrage. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that was like a five chapter typo. Uh, no, it didn't. A lot of people think that it did. Or uh, the most common one I hear is they think it started in the 60s. Wow, it's in the 60s. Yeah, a lot of people think, oh, yeah, feminism started in like the 60s, right? And I'm like, no, no. So if it no, didn't it start with suffrage, when did it start? It kind of goes all the way back to ancient times. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. It goes back to ancient Samaria. It goes back to the earliest civilizations. Um, and a lot of people who aren't Christian, some of the, I have some troll reviews of just feminists who literally say, I didn't read this book, but I know it's garbage. So I'm giving it like a one star rating just to be a jerk. But there are some people who did not like my religious worldview and where I come from with things and wished the book had been more secular. Don't worry, secularists. I have a new book coming out this summer with all of my debate arguments, which are secular arguments. So if you want a resource without the occult stuff and the Christianity stuff and all that, you're going to get your book. Don't worry. 
But occult feminism was about how, as I was studying suffragettes, I noticed this weird thing. I thought I thought I was going to be looking at where their funding came from, and I do go into that in the book. But I noticed that almost all of them were uh, tarot card readers, spirit mediums. Uh, they were theosophists. They were New Agers. They were into a lot of occult religious stuff. And I thought, okay, this is way too many of them to be a coincidence. So I just kept going back and back and back and back, looking for you know the more prominent women's rights activists throughout history, and almost all of them had occult ties. And it made a lot of sense to me because I'm like, well, yeah, if you if you want women's liberation, well, first of all, liberation from what? Well, from the patriarchy. Okay, what's the patriarchy? The patriarchy is just generally the idea that men, since they bear the primary responsibilities of providing for everyone and protecting everyone, should also have the appropriate amount of authority to go along with the massive amount of responsibility. That's what patriarchy actually is. It's been turned into a dirty word that means males oppressing females, right? Men oppressing everyone that's not a white man is what people think it is. And I'm like, well, yeah, so if I was Mary Wollstonecraft during the French Revolution and I had some wild ideas about it's a very revolutionary time where everybody wants liberation from all authority, kind of. This was very, you know, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, it was a revolutionary time and feminism really got roaring first there. But she and other writers from that time period who were writing about women's liberation would often refer back to ancient goddess worship, uh, temple prostitution, um, ancient cultures that did not have, um, like they would intentionally have full moon orgies so that the paternity of the children that came from them could not be established so that the fathers would have no claim and the women would have more power, stuff like that. So I just kept digging further and further into this. And I was like, yeah, okay. So there's a strong precedent of these ideas coming out of occult religions that were diametrically opposed to Christianity, which is inherently patriarchal. As Christians, we believe that's the order that God created. So if you're pagan, or if you're a, an occult religion, or even like a Hindu religion, um, there's a lot more like goddess stuff in it. And women have a lot of sexual power and things like that that they can channel and do spells with and magic. And then you get into witchcraft, which is the same idea. You know, it's the idea that women can use sexual energy, female divine energy to affect the world around them and impose their will on people and got a, a quite deep into the witchcraft stuff, too. So that's traditionally where all this stuff comes from. Yeah. And a lot of the... um the stories about witches, like obviously, we're go I'm going to ask you about the flying on brooms thing, um, but, but uh, <laughs> um, we, that's definitely like a juicy bit to get into about uh, about. But yeah. um, but in general, this kind of symbolism <clears throat> that we use in the witches' stories to really just talk about actual witchcraft, but it's just kind of caricaturized into something maybe more easy to tell stories about and to pass down with children present, I guess, or something. Yeah, and there's also been a huge effort in academia to frame all witchcraft as silly uh, religious people getting their panties in a bunch and having a satanic panic about some single spinster lady who wants to live on the edge of the woods with her cats. That's how the, the academic feminists. They run all the gender studies departments. They run all the women's studies departments. They run the sociology and the psychology departments. It's all run by radical feminists. So they've kind of co-opted the history. And rather than tell you, like, yes, some of the witch trials throughout history, and there's a long history of witch trials, very long. People think it was just like Salem or something in the 1600s. Yeah. Oh, no, it goes it goes way back, especially in Europe. You probably know, but Americans don't. They think it was like this brief little uh, panic that happened in Salem or something. And it really wasn't. It was a long ongoing thing for several centuries, maybe even a millennium of uh, having different witch trials in different places. And were there some times that there was probably some panic and unwarranted um, trials of women accused of witchcraft? Sure. Sure there were. 
Uh, there were even, even some men uh, accused of it, but I think it was like less than 10%. It was mostly women, and they were mostly over 50. I'm actually going to have Professor Edward Dutton on my show tomorrow to talk about his book on witches. Wow. So everybody will probably like that. He's a <laughs> he's a bit I of love, a controversial guy, I love, too. I uh, but... Edward Dutton. I watch him all the time. I talk about him on the show quite yeah. a lot. I, I actually reference him regularly. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. So he's going to come and and add his perspective because mine is a, you know, a Christian perspective. He's pretty sympathetic to Christianity, but he comes from an evolutionary biology perspective, which I don't disagree with. I don't, when he talks about how human beings have adapted to circumstances and climate and pressures, I think that that's all valid, even as a Christian. I may not agree that that's like the origin of species, but I do agree with him about a lot of the you know, social pressures creating different behaviors and people groups and all that sort of stuff. So it should be really interesting. Uh, but a lot of witches were doing things that the gender studies ladies surprisingly don't want to tell you about that got them in trouble. So whether or not you agree these things should have been criminalized in the dark ages of Europe, they were doing things like uh, providing abortions. They were the primary abortion providers. They did do a lot of occult magic, folk magic, things like that. Um, they would do some things sexually that were not <laughs> accepted by society at the time. And when you reference the broomstick in the book, I do talk about that. Sorry, guys, if you don't, if it's a little too juicy for you. But yeah, there were uh, rituals involving the broomstick where they would put hallucinogenic ointments, salves, Herbal mixtures, um, if you guys don't know, I mean, Europe has hallucinogenic uh, natural things that grow all over the place, and they would find these mushrooms, herbs, make teas and salves, and then use them in, like, ritual orgies. That's where the whole broomstick thing comes from, and I do cite where I found that from in the book, and it's actually a woman who's a professor and a second-generation witch herself who goes around speaking about this. Of course, she sees it as a good thing and that they should have been allowed to do this, but I'm saying, okay, if you're in a Christian society and you find out that there's a bunch of women having full moon orgies and taking drugs and casting spells on people and providing abortions, in that context, it doesn't seem as crazy, right, yeah. to... To have a witch trial, I'm just saying. Um, the other thing a lot of people don't know is that witches were also known to be commissioned assassins of certain types. Usually they'd provide poison. That was like the most common thing. Um, if you wanted to kill somebody, you'd go to a witch and she'd give you a poison and you could poison someone. And then a lot of times people would be like, I didn't do it. The witch, did. you know, she tricked me or it was an easy scapegoat for someone. There was actually a, a witch in France. Her name was Lavoisin. I want to say she was 17 or 1800s. I talked about her like in depth on David Patrick Harry's channel once. She is one of the most prolific poisoners in history. She killed thousands of people, French aristocracy, with, via poison. And she was, she called herself a witch. She admitted she was a witch. And she would, you know, uh, do black masses for people and charge money. She would uh, do abortions. She would have uh, poison commissions that she would do and stuff. So this was not like some crazy thing that Christians came up with. This was not a result of paranoia. These women are real and they really did these things. Yeah. For a long, long time. And there would just be certain times in history where witch covens would either grow to the point that they were a serious problem or you'd have somebody like Lavoisin poisoning like half the French aristocracy. And so then the law had to step in and do something about it. So that's actually the more common reason why there were witch trials. And they just they don't portray it that way. Now, um, you know, we have plays and movies that make it seem like Nothing but unfair persecution of innocent victimized women yet again. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. how much are we going to buy into the women have just always been perpetual victims and they didn't ever do nothing. They was just sitting there minding their own business and <laughs> men just persecuted them for no reason. Right. And uh, it's funny because it is just about how that lens shifts around. Right. That what, what's acceptable and what isn't. And maybe what people what's in the kind of the memory of people, whether it's their grandparents' memory or so on, is what affects so much of what you think is okay. So I, I, I'm really convinced that, you know, this cycle of societal collapse that we tend to go through in history, mm -hmm. that the closer you are to that, probably the stricter you're going to be with women. Because you've yeah. kind of seen the end stage and you're like, 
No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> not, yes, not, that's uh, Professor Dutton talks about that a lot. How we can see whenever empires rise, feminism and sexual liberation comes in, and then the decline begins, and that's that. And um, you know, he's he's pretty white pilled about the fact that uh, feminism is going to kind of destroy itself, and I think that it will in time. I do think that. Like people will always be like what do I do with this information? And I'm like, well, the good thing is uh, if you're a feminist, you're probably not having a lot of kids. If you do get pregnant, you tend to uh, have that situation taken care of most of the time because they want their career and their cat and they don't want to uh, listen to a man or anything. So they tend to not, the only way they reproduce is through ideology, which is why I just think if we just continue to push back on the ideology, Maybe we can head some of this off and, and turn it around a little bit before imminent collapse. But on the whole, because people ask me that, they'll be like, do you think we'll ever get any of this stuff overturned? Like, are we ever going to go back to women not voting? Are we ever going to go back to? And I'm like, it's not really about going back. You know, you can't put toothpaste back in a tube. So you shouldn't have this idea of like, oh, we have to go back. Um, we can return to principles that we know create stability. Like in that way we can go back, but it's not really about like trying to do Renaissance fair or fifties housewife, like costume LARPing and pretend that we're back in a different time. It's more like, um, trying to go back to truth and, uh, people don't know what truth is. They don't even believe in it. You know, we, when we have moral relativity and materialism and people can't, people can't think they can't argue, which is one reason that Andrew and I think debate and philosophy and logic is so important because it helps people sort through nonsense and figure these things out. Um, but on the whole, yeah, it's, uh, there probably will be some kind of a collapse. Uh, I, I don't yeah. want there to be, but just it's looking that way. We have a uh, population decline. We have supply chain interruption. We've got, uh, you know, a lot of problems that indicate that there could be collapse. And in that case, yeah, you probably will see a lot less feminism because, like I said, ain't nobody a feminist when the power goes out. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And people learn from the mistakes, but then they forget. Yep. Right. They learn yes. and then they forget. And I think mm -hmm. that's why that's why you, people can always look back and say, "Oh, look, this many hundred years ago, uh, gay people were persecuted, women were persecuted, and so on." And I, I feel like maybe they knew something. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. They, Maybe yeah, maybe incentivizing, yeah, incentivizing destructive behavior is not good for society, you know, uh, but people have this funny idea that uh, you hear this all the time, right? Well, it's not the behavior. It's the stigma. That's the problem. If we just remove all stigma and make everything permissible, everyone will be happy. It's a very like silly, like literally Sodom and Gomorrah. It is. <laughs> but that's what they th they think there's nothing wrong with that they think there's nothing like we just had the guy on there's that clip of andrew talking to the guy who said he doesn't mind if both his parents want to do only fans both yeah. my parents should just do only fans because why not i want them to have a good sex life and i want them to have oh, lots yeah. of money I i'm just like clip. yeah the, so the there's people who actually bite the bullet yeah they actually bite the bullet and they're like yeah i think all the i think all the milfs should be doing only fans or whatever but but you're also starting to see something else which elijah schaefer talks about sometimes which is called hoflation so when all the women are 304s when they are all hoeing right and every girl has an only fans guess what nobody values that anymore because there's so much corn everywhere and it's so free and so accessible and so easy now the average girl makes like $130 a month on an OnlyFans, which really disincentivizes it because they're not getting clicks, they're not getting attention, and they're not getting money. So why do it, you know? So I'm hoping that because of hoflation, <laughs> the value of putting your butt on the internet or putting your, you know, your lady bits on the internet, it will become so unrewarding in so many ways if if everyone's doing it it's like you're not going to get the attention i think women do it for attention more than for money i think money is a part of it for sure but i think mm -hmm. mainly 
a lot of women want to put pictures of themselves out there and just read the comments. Oh my gosh, you're so stunning queen. Uh, I'll pay you a thousand dollars for your bath water. I would die to be with you. Like all that simp stuff. I think that's yeah. the main thing. And hopefully the hoflation gets to the point where women decide it's, it's probably not worth it anymore. And then maybe it will be cool to be one of the few high value women who's got either a really low body count, or maybe you're even a virgin. You don't have tattoos and you don't have college debt and you're going to get that top 5% of men and you're going to be married and you're going to have a family and you're going to have a nice life. And maybe women will start looking at that and going, Oh, maybe I want that instead. And maybe we'll see, um, maybe we'll see some change there. I would hope so. I don't know if that's realistic, but that's what I'm hoping for. I'm just hoping for, and you know what my thinking on it is, if I can get a thousand women to decide to get married and stay with their children's dad and raise them at home, I've won. Like I've, if I've affected a thousand families that way, I couldn't ask for anything more. That's a thousand children who grow up in stable homes or more, you know, um, and don't have divorced parents and mom's boyfriends coming and going all the time and uh, higher likelihoods of abuse and neglect and every it puts kids at risk for everything. So if I can just convince a thousand women to stay home and stay married and be mothers, like I have done my job and I'm happy. So that's all I'm trying to do. Yeah. Why is there, I'm going to kind of get back into your book content a little bit more, but why is there, um, uh, there's always, it feels like a sexual kind of undertone to this or a control it's used as a mechanism. And we like, as men, it's more difficult for us to kind of spot the, that, that that in women but we can certainly like we can see what's driving men like whenever you look at a whenever you look at like a a male feminist podcaster or um group of podcasters it's never like it's never like some chad sitting there like right it's never like this, this, <laughs> like, this, this, this like intelligent good looking guy or anything sitting there you know it's never like <laughs> let me think i don't want to over i don't want to over commit to this but you know it's never david patrick harry sitting in front of the camera right going on about um about how how poor poor, poor women and how how important feminism is and everything like that right and right. we can see that <laughs> as, as as men we know exactly what's going on there and when you say it people call you out and similarly yeah. when i argue if i ever say anything anything anti-feminist in some sort of a youtube comment section or something like that the first thing that will get thrown at me will be oh you probably just don't get any you know yeah i'm, I'm kind of, that's like the yes. first thing and, and you're always just kind of like I've got four kids. <laughs> like, I know. You know that's not, do you, it's not a concern. Do you know the top two things that women say to my husband on the internet? The first one is what you just said. Oh, you're just mad because you don't get any. And we say the same thing. Where do you think all these kids came from? And the second one is you're secretly gay. And you must be like, gay. Well, you you're closeted <laughs> gay. Yeah. It's, it's always that's women's two favorite things to say to them. It's like, you have a small penis. You're secretly gay. You just can't get any, you want to sleep with me. It's just so gross to me. It's so pathetic. It's like, yeah, those yeah, are the yeah. things women do that make me embarrassed to be grouped in with them because I'm like, okay, I have a brain in my head. I don't just walk around with this. Like <laughs> you just have a small deck. You know, it's just like, ew, just have some self-respect and like use your brain and have some dignity. But yeah, that's that's generally what they'll say. And I think, well, the simp problem. So what happened when we when the sexual revolution was unleashed, men thought it was going to be a good deal. They thought we're going to get sex without all the trappings and attachments. Like, I don't have to court some girl and marry her and be stuck with her forever. I can just get sex, right? At least I can have some of that and then maybe settle down when I'm ready. And I think most men thought that this would be the case. But what we're seeing in the last 50, 60 years since this has happened is the only people on the male side who benefit from sexual revolution are not the men who want families, not the men who want children, not the men who want marriage. It's the like Andrew Tates of the world who are not looking for any of that and just want to figure out ways to like, you know, get a virgin to sleep with them and then dump her or things like that. It's the kind of men who, who aren't going to settle down and don't want to settle down. And the top like five or 10% of men are getting like 80% of the women. 
it's insane. So now like women find something like 80% of men unattractive. It's like if they're under six foot, if they're bald, if they're slightly overweight, if they don't make enough money, like the things that women are looking for is only in a tiny group of guys. Um, yeah. And so all the other guys are looking at a life of sexlessness. And so we have an incel problem. And so the incels go one of two ways. They either become like really mig tau bitter black pilled and like do a mass pew pew event type of like the, who was that kid who did that? The, the Supreme gentleman guy who went on a rampage. They either go full incel like that or yeah. they turn into simps. They turn into these absolutely shameless simps who will just, run around the internet telling women they're beautiful and calling them queens and defending them and white knighting them and all this kind of stuff. Just hoping like that's a, a male feminist, like beta male strategy to try to squeeze in there. They're the kind of guys that will be a girl's friend for like 20 years, just waiting for her to go through a bad breakup and have a little too much wine so that they can like sneak in there. It's those kind of guys. And like you said, guys like you or Andrew, or DPH will see guys like that. You guys instantly know what they're up to. You guys are like, I see what you're doing. I see your little, your little loser mating little strategy. Little game you're doing here. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Yeah, you see it straight away. And that's the thing. Yeah, I've, I've heard that stat that what is it? Women find eighty percent of men to be a five or below out of ten or something. When they rate, wasn't that it? That that's the rating. Yeah. I think eighty percent of men yeah. are five or below. And uh, yeah, they have that stipulation. I happen to be exactly six foot. Right, weirdly exactly six foot that I can use yeah. myself as a measuring stick. Like, yeah, Andrew is too. It. He's like yes. exactly six foot two. Six no, foot tall okay. as well. Yeah. Six foot tall. Mm -hmm. And when you're six foot, then you know how few men are six foot or above. Right. When you're exactly six foot. Now a lot of men say they're six foot, but most yeah. of the men that say they're six foot are about two inches shorter than me. So yeah. <laughs> you know, yes. like so um but yeah, there's not that many guys. Like you'll see a guy six, eight, six, 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 four, six, three. You see those guys, but most guys, you don't see them very most much. Most guys aren't. Them. And I, I interviewed my grandmother on my channel and she's 97. And I asked her, you know, what dating was like when she was young and how she met grandpa and all those kind of things and what she was looking for in a man. And she didn't say any of those things. She never said tall. She never said handsome. She never said he has to make a lot of money. She, her list was like, um, he has to be kind to me. Like I have to know he's going to treat me well. Uh, he has to have a nice family. We have to believe in the same things. Like I would want we'd want to go to the same church. Like she wouldn't even necessarily want to marry someone like she's Protestant. So maybe she wouldn't want to marry a Catholic guy. Cause she wouldn't want to have to fight about how we're raising the kids or something. Um, and you know, like, does he have a good reputation? Do I like his mother? You know, she was thinking in such a different way when she got married in 1944, than women think now that it's, it's almost inverted. Like I didn't hear her list any of the things that women list now. And I don't think my grandfather would have been like, he came from a, a nice middle-class family, but he wasn't rolling in it or anything. He wasn't super tall. My grandma's really small. She's like five foot two. I think my grandpa was like five, nine or five, 10. He wasn't like a super tall guy. My dad is six foot, but his dad wasn't that tall of a guy. I don't think. So it's, it wasn't always this way. And I think in, in times before now, women did think a lot more about long-term security when they were choosing mates. They were looking for stability and they were looking for, because you didn't have birth control, right? So you were like, I'm probably going to end up with quite a few kids. And any woman who's had more than one or two kids, this is my other thing. The women who come at me, they usually have no kids or they might have like one Right. And they're like, well, I don't see why I can't work. And I don't see why you need a man to to provide. I can provide, too. And I can help bring in money. It's like, wait till you have five. I had five that were 11 and under. So I'm like nursing two babies, one on each side. And then I've got like a three year old and a five year old and, a you know, an 11 year old or whatever I had at the time. It's a lot. And there was no way I could work full time and do all of that. And then try paying for daycare for a, a large family. Like I would have had to make like 200,000 a year to make it worth it to pay for daycare and all that. 
And plus, why do I want to have five kids? And then I only see them for like 35 minutes a day. That's insane to me too. So I think people thought so differently before birth control, before dating apps where there's just always going to be another man. You just got to swipe and there'll be a new one. So if anything's wrong with the current guy, just get rid of him and swipe and find a new guy. Um, and I think that's another big mistake women make when they divorce. They assume, so like women will get married when they're maybe 26 or something, not too far past their prime market value, right? They, hmm. they, get involved with their first husband when they're youngish. They divorce him when they're like 37 or 38, thinking that it's just going to be like it was when they were 22, that they'll just hike their boobs up a little bit, go to the pub, as as you say, and there'll just be all these guys just waiting to date them. And they are they do this at 38, and they're like, where's all the good men? Where'd all the yeah. men go? And they're shocked that guys aren't interested. They really, women really think that their sexual power they have, which is in this very limited window of time from when you're maybe 16 to when you're like 26, that's your prime window where you have a lot of power. They yeah. think that's going to last forever. They really don't believe me when I tell them, I don't care how good you age. I don't care how hot you are when you're my age. If you, it wouldn't matter how attractive I was at 42. You put me next to a 22 year old, I'm going to lose every time. That's how yeah. it works. That's never yeah, yeah, going to yeah. change. And women just don't get it. They just don't believe it. Women's magazines truly don't understand that. They'll put up these pictures of like Jennifer Lopez and she looks like she's like 24 and she's like, obviously in a vacuum, you look at that picture and she's like super hot, but they don't understand that that affects men where men are like, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> there's a problem here. <laughs> yeah, like they put um, they put Martha Stewart on the latest uh, Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, and she's like in her 80s. And of course, what they do is that she's like all taped up everywhere, and they airbrush things, and they pose her a certain way, and they fix the lighting. So you go, wow, she looks great for an 80 year old. First of all, I promise you in person, she doesn't look like that. Mm -hmm. But second of all, why are we trying? Well, I know why they're trying. I know why they're doing this. But you think to yourself, why are they trying to convince us that 60 year old Jennifer Lopez is still like this, fer this goddess of fertility? Well, it's because of the same reason we had witches. These old spinsters hate, absolutely hate. It's the story of Snow White. The queen was in insanely jealous of Snow White, who's like 14 in the, in the original fairy tale, because of her youth and fertility and beauty. And the queen is getting older and resents that she doesn't have that incredible sexual power over men anymore. And so these old women that run these magazines and, and things like that. And then also the occult stuff does come into it because a lot of these people want like a transhuman future where we have artificial wombs and you can extend life like abnormally long and you can just plump and fill everything. I mean, the women out there right now look like Goldie Hawn and Meryl Streep in that old movie, Death Becomes Her. I don't know if I'm just showing my age or if you've seen that movie, <laughs> I, but I it's a movie. It, but... <laughs> oh, it's a movie where these two women, uh, one of their husbands, one of them is his ex and one of them is, is his wife. And he's a mad scientist who creates like some kind of potion that will keep them young and beautiful forever. Uh, and they die. And so now that they're dead, uh, it's still kind of like, they're still alive. Like they can still walk around, but their body needs like constant maintenance. And they're stuck with this guy forever because he's the only person that can keep spackling back all the, you know, all the things that are peeling <laughs> off and falling down and everything. And it's a, it's a comedy. It's pretty funny, but that's what we have. We have women that have like, I need five grand a month to keep up on my lash extensions, my hair extensions, my nail extensions, my lip fillers, my Botox, my, all my plumping and sucking fat out of here and pumping it into there. And it's like human blow up dolls walking around and, and they're telling women that like, you can do this. You can perpetuate your sexual power into your eighties. And it's not realistic for most of us. I think it's psychologically damaging the Kardashians do this, you know, they, they kind of really started and kicked off all this stuff, but I think it's totally insane. And I don't know how y'all feel about it, but personally I like normal faces. I like 
people's real faces. These girls yeah. with the giant fish lips and the insane snuffleupagus eye eyelashes. I don't. And... I don't think most men like it. I I can't. I don't believe it. Maybe just the same way as like some women in these really big cities have weird taste in men. Maybe some of those men have this taste in women, but I don't believe it. And I've heard I don't on think different they do either. on different kind of uh, podcast shows guys saying that they're saying girls. They haven't figured out the lips. Stay away from the lips. <laughs> like, don't do it. It's so but, uh, bad. You see, yeah, and yeah. they all start to look alike. They all start to blend into this. They all look like a fish. You get you get your nose so skinny it barely exists anymore. You know, your face is just your nose needs to disappear for some reason. We don't like noses. Noses are out. It just cut it off. And then make your lips huge and make your eyelashes so big that you can't hold your eyelids up. Like literally some of these girls can't hold their eyelids open and they look perpetually tired and they just yeah, have this yeah. fake eyelashes hanging down in their eyes. Um, I think that men will just like, they, if that's all there is, if all the women look like that, where they are, like if you're in California, if you're in the Los Angeles area, this is like most women. So you just, do you pick from what you've got and they'll deal with it. Like men will respond to whatever the market gives them, but no, I don't, I don't think it's ideal. And I'm just, I feel so patronized by these magazines and these movies and these TV shows. I'm like, another JLo is sexy movie? Ugh, I'm just yeah. so tired of it. I don't want to suspend my disbelief to that degree for yet another hour and a half long crappy Jennifer Lopez movie. Can you give me mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. that doesn't suck? And the hilarious thing is, if you actually want to hold on to your market value as a woman, the only way to do it is to lock down a guy and he 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 continues to see you as having the that market value that's that sense that when he first met you right and it's yeah. the only way to to encapsulate that moment in your life right and they, i'm so they, glad they that you said that. that i'm so glad <laughs> you said that because i think people need to hear that from a man too because if i say that they go oh it's just cope you're just mad because you're old and fat um, I get that all the time from like younger women who hate me. It's like, you're old and fat and you're just jealous. And I'm like, you want to compare pictures of me at 22 to you at 22 or me at 19 to you at 19? Let's go. But guess what? You're not going to look like that forever either. Um, and five kids later, I don't look like that. But Andrew is always telling me, he's like, I don't, he, he's like, basically like, you look the same to me. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is kind of crazy because, like, obviously I can see the differences over the years, but he's kind of like, hey, you look the same to me. Like, I don't, I don't even notice. <laughs> but I think a lot of it is we've been through so much together. Like 16 years together, we've been to hell and back a couple of times. We've been through things together that no one else will ever understand him the way that I do because of the things we've gone through and because we've raised a family and we've struggled together. And that does count for a lot. You do get your love goggles after being married to somebody a long time. You just, you really do start to see so much more of the good in them than the bad if you let yourself. But I think women tr are trained to like pick every little flaw, right? To pick every yeah. little flaw in a man and nag at it and be like, well, yeah, he might do 99 out of 100 things good, but this one tiny thing he does has to change or else, like, I'm out of here. And it's kind of a form of shit testing, and women are fabulous at shit testing. But um, if you just soften up a little, ladies, and, like, allow yourself, it, we have this guard up, right? We have this guard where it's like, I'm not going to let a man tell me nothing. And I'm not going to let him. It's like, just relax and allow yourself to like really love your husband. And you will suddenly start to, like, you won't really notice the flaws and you'll notice all the fantastic things about you and about him. And he becomes more attractive to you over time. And you like, I feel like that all the time. I'm like, wow, I feel like I really got away with something here. And I hope he doesn't figure out that I've kind of gotten <laughs> the upper hand and like really netted myself someone I probably don't deserve. But and it's funny because like people who hate him will say, oh, your wife's more talented and successful than you are. And then people who hate me will be like, you've just been sponging off your man for 16 years. And we both kind of laugh because neither one of us thinks of it that way at all. But, you know, it's just angry Internet trolls. So, yeah, yeah, they all they, they have to say something. They always have to try and find something that's going to bother you.
Yeah. All right, so Jer, Jer M just said, once women turn 50, they become invisible. I think that's a symptom of the fact that you're so visible at 20 and you yes. set that as your... As, whereas men are like invisible at that age. It doesn't matter how good looking you are or how ripped you are. Well, nope. within reason, but largely right. men are invisible. Like we walk around invisible the whole time. Yeah, maybe <laughs> if you're Brad Pitt, yeah, you get a lot of visibility, but you're right. Like men, it's a fundamental difference in the age at which your worldview is formed. So men, as they are going through puberty and their teenage years and their early 20s, they usually go through some awkward stuff. They got the voice change going on. They got the awkward facial hair that hasn't fully come in. Um, and men learn at that age that nobody gives a shit. Nobody cares about you. It's about what you can produce and what kind of value you can provide as a man, period. And nobody cares about your problems. There was that viral video of a woman who transitioned to being a man crying and sobbing because she didn't know how difficult life was as a man and how just nobody cared and the world was so cruel. And it was just like she was like borderline self-deleting because of how hard life as a man is and how cruel and uncaring the world is. Girls have a totally opposite experience where you're a little girl and everybody thinks you're cute and adorable. And you get doted on a lot by everyone around you because you're an adorable little girl. And then you hit puberty. And suddenly, like, I had this experience as a tomboy. I was, like, always into playing with boys. Uh, I dressed more like a boy. Uh, I hung out with most of my friends were boys. And then I hit puberty. I was one of those girls that it happened, like, overnight. Like, I just woke up one day and I went, ah, what are these? Oh, my God, what do I do? <laughs> it was, I wasn't very comfortable with it at all. And suddenly, like, all my boyfriends around me treated me very different. It was, like, overnight. And I didn't like it. And I could see how as if I had been born 30 or 40 years later, I might have fallen for the trans stuff. I might have thought, well, maybe I'm a boy. Maybe I can get these things removed and then I can go back to just, like, playing with the guys and being one of the guys. It took me a long time to, like, fully come into my femininity and be comfortable with it. But you do go through this phase where it's like doors are open for you. If you're on the side of the road and your tire's flat, someone's going to come by and help you. If you get to the cash register and you've forgotten your debit card, the guy behind you will probably pay for your stuff. You get drink spot for you. You get taken out on dates. You just you get treated differently by the whole world because of your youth and your beauty. And so it's really all that you've known. By the time you're 25, that's been your experience as an adult, that you've never had any other way of existing so yeah i think that compared to that when you get to be my age if you haven't built a life for yourself like i have thankfully by the grace of god built a life for myself that was never built on my sexuality or my attractiveness or anything like that i've got a really rich and wonderful life and aging gracefully isn't too hard for me but i could see how if i had built my life on that mindset and I got to the age I am now and you're starting to get a little wrinkles and your gravity is kicking in and you're getting some gray hair and it would be rough. You would feel like, why do I suddenly not matter? Why does suddenly nobody care about me? So I always just advise women not to do that. I'm like, don't build your life on this very temporary situation. It's really dangerous. The buzz record says he didn't start developing breasts until he was in his 40s. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> so, well, <you> know. <laughs> um, yeah, it's... so it's tough it's tough yeah but it's, it's definitely true i can only imagine what it's like um what it's like to kind of suddenly get all that kind of attention obviously you know teenage boys and boys and the young men in their young 20s do get some attention from women that we don't get as much of when we're in our late 30s but it's not in that same category. I think, no, as and women, where men it's... have to get used to rejection. That's the other big piece. You boys learn from like seventh or eighth grade that for every girl you ask to dance at the dance, probably half or more of them are going to say no before one of them says yes. That you're going to ask a girl to homecoming, she's going to say no and break your heart. You're going to ask a girl out and she's going to say no and you're going to be set. Like men get conditioned that, hey, I'm not always going to get what I want. I'm going to be told no. Women do not get that. And so I yeah, think yeah, that's yeah. the other reason women get to their 30s and start hearing no from men. And they're like, what do you mean? And then that's abuse, right? This is this is the world we live in now. We're just a men going, mm, no, Cheryl, we're not going to do that. Thanks for your input, but that's not what we're going to do. And Cheryl's just like, oh, 
how dare you? It's the patriarchy. <laughs> it's misogyny and it's oppression. And women just aren't used to know, I feel like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think my first, uh, the first time I ever got rejected, I wasn't even interested in the girl. We were in McDonald's <laughs> and, and I was 14 and a friend of mine just turned to this like random girl. And in, in, in Ireland at the time, in Dublin at the time, I think maybe in all of Ireland, we would say for kissing, we would say meat, right? That was like wow. the slang term was yeah. meat. So it was like, uh, he turned around to this girl and said, here, would you meet him? <laughs> and she just, <laughs> she, she just turns around and looked at me and went, ugh, I'd rather go to Timbuktu. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> what, like, what did, I, did I, do? I do? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But girls, I don't think girls usually experience that very often. Certainly not pretty ones, which is why you see pretty girl syndrome. Pretty girl syndrome is a real thing. The more attractive a woman is, the more she will not be able to handle any kind of criticism, any kind of boundaries from a man. They're just kind of used to all doors being open to them. And so the minute that starts to be different, they like really can't deal with it and they can't cope with it. And I think when my grandmother was growing up, you got, you had the older women around you saying, Hey, you need to find somebody and settle down before you're 25, because after that, it's all downhill and the good ones have already been picked and you're going to be getting the leftovers. Like we had women older than us who would talk to us about these realities and say, you know, this doesn't last forever. Someday you're going to have menopause and your boobs are going to be down here and it's not going to be like it is right now. But nobody says that to women now and nobody women just grow up in total delusion. I feel like they keep getting um, shown pictures of J-Lo and they just yeah. everyone just. They just keep, they this is what you're going to be like, like when that. you're 60. Yeah. Yeah. No. So um, that idea of, of, sorry, of female sexual power, that was, that's a major part of the, the, the occult side, right? Of feminism, just to kind of yes. drift back there briefly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let, um, Cause like, that's, what's kind of like a driving force behind it. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. So like we were talking about earlier, men are always going to have the upper hand when it comes to like, physical force. Men are going to be bigger and stronger. We see this with like, you know, trans people in women's sports and stuff that the bone structure and the muscle density and just like the, the way that men are designed, they're going to have the monopoly on physical force, but women have the monopoly on sexual power, especially when they're young. And in all forms of magic, occult magic, witchcraft, black magic, pick your, pick your type of magic. There's people that think there's white magic or good magic. That's really not true. It's all, it's all bad stuff. It's all evil. You don't want to be trying to project your will and manipulate outcomes. That's not good. Um, but all magic, it's known that sex magic is the most powerful kind because it's the primary biological imperative. Like there are people who will be starving and still, um, be wanting to mate like that's the it's the main driver more than almost anything we do it's what motivates men to build great civilizations and go to war and and all kinds of stuff it's just a very powerful part of our human experience so if you can use and control sexuality to manipulate men you can have tremendous power and women have throughout history so naturally if you're into the occult or witchcraft that's what you're going to focus on you're going to focus on manipulation of um of sexual power and things like makeup and all of the treatments that we were talking about and now camera angles i can't tell you how many female streamers um like that i've debated they have a very specific camera angle that's like way up here and they've got very specific lighting and you never see like one side of their face and you only see it's all very contrived to project a certain image and a uh to manipulate it's all very manipulative so a lot of women don't even realize this is necessarily what they're doing um it's one thing to use some of your god-given you know femininity to uh, get a good husband and start a family, but there you can abuse that. And I think now that's the norm to abuse it. And I think uh, the reason that feminism is so woven in with occult practice is because of it's exactly for that reason, right? If you're a woman and you want to control or dominate men, that's how you're going to do it. Cause you're not going to, you're not going to like, uh, become a female superhero and start kicking the shit out of green berets, no matter what the movies might tell you, you're going to use uh, sexual power to manipulate and control men. That's generally the way that women do things. Yeah. 
and it is it is like a it's a it's a powerful kind of force like um for sure um but i guess maybe that's what that's where some of the resentment comes from losing it maybe i mean that's why they, they, they kind of want to bottle it and that's why you get all these movies about and what you were talking about this kind of staying young thing they want to they want to hold on to this power right? yeah. that they can kind yeah of think of all the of think of all the movies and fairy tales like the little mermaid a lot of disney princess movies have this theme of like ursula the sea witch who's old and fat um, trying to literally bottle, I mean, in the movie, it's like Ariel's voice. But if you go read the actual original fairy tale, The Little Mermaid was a totally different story. I have a piece on my sub stack about that, I think. But um, same thing with Snow White, same thing with uh, Sleeping Beauty, same thing with Cinderella. Like, usually it's a story of like an older, evil female who's single, right? The Cinderella mm -hmm. stepmom the the queen and snow white ursula the sea witch there's so many movies where it's like an older nefarious female character trying to like steal or co-opt the the femininity beauty fertility of like a younger character who's a woman that sort of that's what the witch always does and that's what i mean that's another thing witches had a reputation for doing things like drinking baby blood or adwina quom um some of those things that you hear about <laughs> like even yeah. hillary clinton like some of the rumors about hillary clinton and some of the like female elites it's always like older unattractive women trying to like co-opt that power from younger more attractive fertile women it's kind of like a an archetype i guess yeah, and you see that you see like it, I know, you get into all these kind of um, you know these interpretations of movies and things, and you see that in things like you know in the nineties we had Hocus Pocus, you know yeah. where they're literally putting these this young girl or up and and or, or young boy up and like sucking this this life force out of them, and they're all yeah. acting kind of high, and there's this whole thing, and that was long before all that that kind of stuff came out, right? And you, yep. it's everywhere that kind of thing. It's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, in the book, I talk about Matilda Joslyn Gage, who was a suffragette who was ex expressly opposed to Christianity, hated it, thought it was terrible. And she was the mother-in-law of L. Frank Baum, who wrote The Wizard of Oz uh, books, which later became a very famous movie. Um, and she was a major influence on him. In fact, I'm a little suspicious as to what might have been going on with this family dynamic. Because L. Frank Baum married Matilda Joslyn Gage's daughter, but they lived with her like their whole lives until she died of old age. And he he talks about her the way that a man who's in love talks about a woman, if you know what I mean. So I don't know what might have been going on there, but uh, that's where the first I idea of a good witch came from was from her. She wanted to portray witches as something good, something uh, benevolent. There's a good witch and a bad witch. And the good witch can be like a fairy godmother type of figure and that sort of thing. So, like, she as a feminist was trying to convince us that witches are really not so bad. They're they're pretty good. They can be good, you know. Uh, but, yeah, you see a lot of that sort of thing in movies. If you kind of pay attention to movies and books and TV shows, you'll see the effort by feminists to try to portray them as the the good ones and then also smarter wilier crafter than craftier than everyone else and like they're the ones that have the real power and the wisdom and and can control things so and that's certainly you... every feminist i've known <laughs> <laughs> why do you think there is this, this strong connection this historical connection between witchcraft and feminism well because what you're trying to do as a witch is uh assert your will you're trying to uh project your will onto reality and get what you want. I mean, that's the point of spell crafting. That's the point of witchcrafting. And people like these little Wiccan girls and little witch girls will come and be like, we have ethical witchcraft. We believe that if we do something bad, it comes back to us threefold and blah, 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 blah. But it's like you trying to project your will and control outcomes is the witchcraft. So you can sit here and say you're doing good witchcraft all day. I don't buy it. Um, but more than that, I think that's why it, it's a literal inversion of Christianity. In Christianity, we have the Virgin Mary who is pure. She's chaste. Um, nothing about her is sexual at all. Um, she doesn't ever try to assert power or dominance over anyone. Um, she is an example through service and submission. 
Um, and witchcraft inverts that. It literally takes that. And that's why you have figures like the Black Madonna or um, other inverted figures in the occult of basically taking the Virgin Mary and inverting her completely. And instead, um, you have people like, like Madonna, the pop star. You Like mm -hmm. pop stars are a great one. If you guys ever watch Jamie Hanshaw, she's, this is like her wheelhouse. All the different pop stars and female superstars out there who use witchcraft and witchcraft themes. Taylor Swift is another one. Like all these pop star girls are really into this stuff. And it becomes about uh, becoming the dominant one. That's why like uh, the, I always talk about the first cover of Ms. Magazine being a picture of the goddess Kali with her necklace of severed men's heads and her belt of severed men's arms that she wears. And then standing, she's always pictured with her foot on the chest of Shiva, who's like her male cohort. And in the Pearl video I just did, people, a lot of Hindus, I guess there's a lot more like Indian Pakis and stuff over there in the UK. They were trying to think that I was saying Hindu is a feminist religion. I, I wasn't saying that that at all. I was saying feminists saw that and co-opted it. They see the vengeful goddess archetypes as their heroes. They see Lucifer as a liberator. Anything that's an inversion of the Christian patriarchal order, they're going to champion and they're going to be very attracted to it. And they're going to like take that on. So that's how why. Do you think you, how do you think people end up like that? Uh, especially like Luciferian and so on, where they want to invert in that way. Well, I think that it's really hard for a lot of people. They hear, I mean, just imagine the, the modern woman, and I've heard women say this, and this was even me, like in my 20s. If you hear the word submission, you think slavery. You think, mm -hmm. oh, I'm less than, uh, subjugated. You think um, of like stripping away someone's agency or their personhood or their rights, which w Andrew loves to get into the rights question on that all the time. But um, I think that, Everybody wants to have power and control. I think a lot of people have fantasies about power and control and, and things like that. Um, and women, because we don't have a monopoly on physical force, I think a lot of women think they need some kind of protection and uh, that if they submit, it makes them susceptible. It makes them vulnerable. Well, nobody likes to be vulnerable. That's scary. You know, you don't want to be you don't want to be vulnerable. So if you hear a word like submission, now from a Christian perspective, we don't think of submission that way. Uh, like I was just saying, a lot of the female saints were servants. They sacrificed themselves and everything they had in, in service to others in you know Christian service and sacrifice to other people. And I think men are a little bit more open to the idea of like, I mean, men will break themselves. Men will break their bodies over decades working to take care of the people around them, to provide for them, to protect them. It makes them feel like a man. It gives them a sense of purpose. But I think for women, when they hear submission, they just have all these bad connotations and they think danger, they think vulnerability. But really, that's not that's not how it is. I mean, like I've said, you're going to end up appealing to good men to protect you if anything goes wrong anyway, unless you think you can use like your witchcraft powers to. But that's that's in the movies, right? For the most part, unless you're willing to poison people, I suppose, or something like that. But, you know, I think people don't want to be vulnerable. So they they end up. I mean, Edward Dutton has this theory that it's the. Gen he calls them mutants, <laughs> um, but like the genetically less fortunate, we'll call them people who are maybe not so aesthetically pleasing people who are not so sexually attractive women who are probably not going. I mean, it's not tough though, ladies. I'm just saying like, there's a lot of hideous women who are married inexplicably to me married and like doted on by their husbands all the time. And they usually have horrible attitudes and everything else. And I always look at them and I'm like, how did you pull this off? I don't know why any man would put up with you, but they do. But I think there are women who, yeah, they are envious of other women who are more attractive. They're envious of other women who they think got a better deal or get more attention. Um, and they become extremely resentful. Um, I've talked about it a little bit before, but my mother is definitely that way. She, I grew up hearing horrible things about 
women, especially the more attractive they were. Like women at her job who would get a promotion, she would say, oh, okay. it's because you had to be because she's sleeping with the boss or had to be because. Of... So I think it's like resentment, you know? Yeah. It's kind of wanted to be the top. Isn't it biblical as well? Um, eh, doesn't it wasn't the punishment for men, um, for Adam, that he would have to um, work by the sweat of his brow and work against thistles and thorns? And the, the punishment for Eve was that she was going to have painful childbearing and she was going to be ruled over by men and, and resent it. Well, yes. Isn't resent it stipulated, right? So Yeah, yeah. That your desire shall be for your husband and you will want to rule over him. And I, that, that's what we see, right? Like women want attention from men. Most women do. Uh, some of them get so deep into it that they become true man haters and actually want to be separatists. But most women do want male attention. They do want male companionship, but at the same time, they resent that they want that. They resent the man for any number of reasons we've already described. But yeah, I think that that's what it is. And a lot of people, I think, misconstrue that curse and this is one of the things that i love the orthodox understanding of genesis is that when god said to adam and eve what have you done he wasn't asking because he didn't know he was offering them a chance to repent but eve blamed the serpent she did not repent and then adam blamed the woman and he kind of blamed god he was like it's this woman you gave me you gave her to me and she she's the one that talked me to it so he didn't repent either and that's why he was going to curse the serpent either way cuz lucifer is unredeemable but he was giving them a chance to repent and they did not repent and so you know that's these are the things we both have to deal with but in the modern world we try to act as though there is still some kind of, first of all, I don't think we have a patriarchy at all, which is why I'm always saying we should restore it. We have mm -hmm. some other kind of inverted bizarre system where women are, it, are at the same time innocent victims who can never do anything wrong and also strong and empowered and independent and don't need a man. And I'm like, don't you have to pick one? How can you be a perpetual victim and also be a girl boss? Like, we, how, yeah. how can you be both at once? Do you ever wonder if what we're living through, just I've you've pointed out a few of those contradictions now, and I always wonder on the topic of Edward Dutton, is this the collapse of IQ? Are like are some of us just like we would have been like 100 IQ like in 1870, but now we just feel like we're geniuses because nobody seems to be able to understand basic logic, right? You know, uh, I kind of in do. Is it idiocracy in effect? I think so. Well, I think um, I think he'll probably have some wonderful things to say about the genetics and all the reasons why the epigenetics are are what they are. But there's also this uh, well understood social engineering that's happened. I had John Kleizek on my channel to talk about his book School World Order, which goes into the public education system and how it was designed, what it was designed to do, and it was never designed to truly make people smarter. Like I always tell this story about how in kindergarten I figured out that you know they told me I was going to school to learn and get smart and I figured out by the end of the first week oh no this isn't about any of that at all this is about conditioning me to follow rules and um kind of group think and be spoon-fed what they want me to think not for me to learn how to think which is my other big reason I advocate for homeschooling like uh my kids are I don't think they're like genetic geniuses. I don't think Andrew and I are just like above and beyond and we're just so brilliant that we created these like superhuman children. But they've been taught to think. They've been taught to learn and to to discover how to learn things they don't know and to think things through. And we don't do that anymore, which is why it's so hard for me to break through people's programming sometimes. And because first I ha they have to unlearn all the things they think they know. Like I've said, if you do a, a man on the street to every random person, you go, you put the microphone up and you say, can you describe what you think life was like for women in the 1600s or even just in 1890 before the vote? Oh, well, um, they were basically slaves and they couldn't leave their house and they couldn't read and they weren't allowed to do anything. And they just have a complete, total misconception. And most people don't know anything about history. They don't know anything about geography. I mean, Americans are notorious for being some of the worst on these things because of our education system. Most Americans don't know the capital of their own state, let alone be able to point to where Ireland is on a map. They don't know. 
So there's a bit of a deliberate dumbing down, and then there's probably, you know, epigenetic factors that are at play as well, I would think. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because I, I only, as I said, I'm I'm, I'm behind on movies. <laughs> so Me I only too. saw Idioc Idiocracy recently. So I've just started referencing it now, you know, like, I don't know how many years too late. I'm kind of late yeah. to the party. Yeah, now when I see people do something, like, exceptionally dumb, I'll, like, turn to one of my kids and be like, welcome to Costco. I love you. <laughs> you know, or they, they know immediately what that means. Um, but, yeah, it's it's we are definitely to the point where the dumb people think the smart people are stupid. Uh, you don't know how many people who know nothing, nothing about anything I talk about will boldly assert to me that I am stupid. And don't know mm -hmm. what I'm saying. That I'm just, yo, what are you, dumb? Are you just dumb? And I'm just like, oh boy. But with those people, it's like, where do you even begin? Where yeah. where do you even begin? Because they're not even curious. They're not even curious. Like, could, hmm, could I be wrong? So maybe I should at least Google some of this before telling this lady that she's a stupid idiot who doesn't know anything. And it's it's like people that you're like, have you ever read a history book? No, but I don't need to read a history book to know that you're wrong. That kind of stuff. Um, and we do have a hard time finding people who can debate. Mm -hmm. That's really tough anymore. It's hard to find people who even know what a debate is, what an argument is what fallacies are. Uh, Jay Dyer is always perpetually, he spends his whole life in a state of perpetual flustered frustration about the fact that <laughs> so many people can't think their way out of a paper bag and will, th and therefore think he is the dumb one. It's, yeah. it's quite something. <laughs> it's a recognized phenomenon as well that people do that. They do recognize when something's a certain distance above their head, they recognize it as stupid rather than yeah. as really complicated. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's it's a it's a bizarre thing. It is. So um, one thing, I, the one last thing I wanted to ask you about that I actually heard you saying on um, on Pearl's chat earlier today was about or yesterday, sorry, was um, about all the people who were involved with the early days of feminism, the who had intelligence connections. Oh, yeah. I wanted to find I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, so there's, whenever you're kind of studying real history, um, because everybody knows history is kind of, uh, you can change it depending on your perspective, and there's something called standpoint theory, which has been the dominant theory since the 1970s in universities when the radicals took over in universities and started running all the departments, where they tell the history as from the standpoint of the oppressed, which means they rewrote it to fit their narrative is all that that means. But when you go and dig in and read about the stuff they don't tell you in school, you find a lot of overlap with social engineering, intelligence, and sometimes organized crime, espionage type of stuff. Um, a lot of the early suffragists and um, people who were influential on like 19th century feminism were involved in intelligence, like Helena Blavatsky, the founder of Theosophy. She's a well-known um, intelligence asset. Aleister Crowley was also an asset, and many of the women around him who were involved in feminism probably were as well, whether uh, knowingly or unknowingly, some of them could have just been feeding him intel, some of them could have been actually um, working with agencies. Um, if you look at people like Margaret Sanger, she had a lot of high-level connections with people who were connected to intelligence, and she was kind of chosen by this elite establishment to be the face of Planned Parenthood and the birth control movement and all that kind of stuff. She didn't just get there organically because she was so brilliant. She was kind of a nobody who was just, she started going to some socialist meetings at a very prominent uh, New York group. And she was kind of just plucked from obscurity to be the face of this. And she wasn't like a direct intelligence asset that I'm aware of, but she was basically working at the behest of various elites and traveling the globe, um, talking to like really high level people that she would never normally be connected to. Then we get to the sixties and the CIA starts to actually co-opt feminism and infiltrate it. Uh, at, the CIA has a long history of taking kind of some small grassroots movements, 
but then funding them and steering them. So they did that with like the civil rights movement. They definitely did that with feminism through Clay Felker, who was a CIA agent who funded Gloria Steinem and all of her activities. She again was recruited straight out of Smith College to work for the CIA. They funded Playboy, which Steinem uh, had a little little period of time working for Playboy. And then they funded Ms. Magazine, the very first you know, women's feminist magazine in the 70s that was marketed towards suburban housewives to change the culture for that express purpose. Um, uh, and then through the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was a much bigger program that controlled a almost all the media outlets around uh, the West in the 70s. Uh, in various parts of the world, even in Japan, they had some some publications that they controlled um, and they propped her up as well. So I'll talk about how there were other feminists who were probably a lot smarter than Gloria Steinem. But, you know, she was actually considered to be more attractive at that time. At that time, she was fashionable. Um, she had like highlighted hair um, and she was uh, kind of charismatic, whereas people like Betty Friedan or Simone de Beauvoir were very dry, very they fit the stereotype, like the witch stereotype of being unattractive and difficult to listen to, shrill voice. Nobody wanted to hear that. So the CIA would pick like people they thought were good spokespeople. And they used that to disseminate all this ideology and push things like the sexual revolution and have this incredible influence and control. So yeah, shockingly, there's a lot of ties to not only the occult, but to intelligence in these movements too. And I guess um, we can see what the end is. We can see kind of what's been going on now um, and how things... Do you not at least concede that at least women got what they wanted? Well, that depends. It depends on what you mean. Um, <laughs> women didn't want the vote. I mean, if we go back to suffrage, there was much larger membership in anti-suffrage groups among women than there were pro-suffrage groups. All of the... Um, polling that they did do. Now, this is interesting. The and the pro-suffragists, the, the activists who wanted women to vote, several times throughout 20 or 30 years blocked referendums to allow women to vote on whether they wanted the vote. Isn't that the most ironic thing you've ever heard? Because they knew, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, they said, we can't let women vote on whether they want to vote because they'll say no. And they've both, they were both quoted as saying, if we leave it up to women, we'll never get suffrage passed. So we have to appeal to, basically they appealed to the simps of the time to get it through. And women didn't even So we should be harsh on simps. Yes, we should. We should be should. much harsher on simps. Like we have yes. to like really, as men, deal with simps. Total simp destruction. If men like my husband were still stuffing simps into lockers and dunking them into trash cans and giving them swirlies, we wouldn't have such a simping problem like we do. It wouldn't be as bad, at least. But yeah, it's it's very crazy to me. Uh, nobody knows this. People, it's one of the most obscure facts that when I say people have never heard it, that it was suffragists who blocked women from voting on whether they wanted the vote. There was only a couple <laughs> referendums they allowed to happen. One was in Massachusetts, and only 4% of the women who bothered to turn out wanted the vote. Um, yeah, just at all the evidence we have says most women didn't want that for lots of, they had really good reasons. Uh, you know, they felt it would divide the home. They thought politics was kind of dirty business and, uh, something they didn't want to be involved in. They thought it would make them lose their moral high ground. They said, look, we're as women, we are not partisan. We're not part of partisan politics. We don't have lobby groups coming at us every which way, trying to like sway us. And therefore we can think. Uh, more neutrally about what's good for children and society. And we can advocate for things like, oh, we want clean water and, and good food quality control. And we want parks for our children to play in, or we want schools. But they thought if we become just another voting block, we lose the moral high ground. And we and now we're partisan like, like men are, and that wouldn't be good. Also, they just didn't care. Kind of like now, like everybody wants to pretend like women are so politically savvy, but women are not. I don't know if I don't know if you've ever like really hammered on a woman about why she voted for someone or something, but it's usually you don't usually get an answer that's like, "Well, I did all the research and I looked at the economic data and I studied the platforms of both of the candidates and 
through reasoning and deduction, I decided that this was the best choice. No, that's never what they say. It's usually like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. what we saw in 2016, where it's like re and scream and my emotions and my feelings and or or like women notoriously will not vote for bald candidates, men who are bald. Uh, they will vote for a guy who has a tan over a guy that looks pasty on the TV. Wow. They're that shallow. Like they, because <laughs> the women's voting demographic, they've done so much research because they became the dominant voting block in the late eighties. Now more women vote than men in the United States. Okay. So all of the, you know, uh, political organizations are researching women like crazy to find out how to get the women's vote. And they found out, like, you don't worry about stats, statistics, figures, economics, anything practical. Appeal to, like, being tan and handsome. Uh, you know, throw a funny joke in there. Like, those are the kind of things that women base their vote off of. And women at the time kind of were more, they were more apt to say, yeah, we like we like sewing and going to parties and gossiping. Like we don't want to do politics. That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> a lot of the, it was funny to me when I was reading all the God awful, boring writing of feminists for my book. It was like two and a half years of reading the most awful feminist writing. Ugh. Oh, so terrible. They're so awful. They're writing, but it was funny because they would all, it was another common thread. I found that they were all permanently frustrated that women just didn't care about politics and didn't care about their feminist, uh, you know, activism. Like they just couldn't get women into it. So some of them did things like write fiction. Um, they would try to like have tea parties or garden parties and then sneak the political speakers into that because they were like, if we just pass out political tracts or advertise this as a political speech, none of the women show up. They don't care. <laughs> so I thought that was Which, a, another funny gem I found in the history. It's so funny because um, it, it kind of ties back to what I was saying at the start about how the women who kind of see this past where men were constantly raping and beating their wives and trying to give their daughters to like mean other men and stuff that they just don't understand men. And I get the same thing from kind of like male feminists that it's like, have you ever being around a woman like you <laughs> this is not what they want like when you actually no. know a woman really really well any particular woman you know but that they don't actually want that that's like that's not what they want like, no no well and sometimes i'll get i'll get comments where people are like they'll see me debating or you know they see andrew and i do a debate together like when we do a team debate they'll be like where can i find a woman like you that's into politics and debate and i'm like first of all you don't want one. That's number one. Like mo most guys would rather talk to their guy friends about that stuff as they should. I'm just weird. Um, and Andrew and I always say we had to end up together because nobody else would want either of us. We're too, <laughs> we're too uh, oddly stuck in our ways and with our little idiosyncratic things. And we just happen to be like a great pair together. But like you want a woman who's a woman and is a good wife and a good mom. And she's probably going to hear you start going off about politics. And she's going to be like, uh, and like start looking over here and trying to find an excuse to like turn her show back on that she's watching or something. Um, so don't look like for a woman that wants to debate or argue politics or theology, like look for a good woman who wants to go to a nice church, who loves babies, who loves animals. Like those are good green flags and women women who are nice to the elderly find a woman who's like kind to elderly people um find a woman who's got a good relationship with her dad like those are the things you should look for now <laughs> not women who are into political debate that's just a one-off thing about my personality that's weird and and shouldn't be modeled to anyone <laughs> i don't think <laughs> Um, yeah, I think I, I got kind of lucky like that in terms of a lot of the things you're describing there and my wife. And I didn't choose that way because, you know, I kind of came from a liberal house. It's just I was a young man and there was there was a girl in, in a pub that was interested in me. So I just kind of went for that. Right. <laughs> but uh, but, but um, there was um, the but yeah, all of those things, good relationship with her father and, you know, and, and while she is very, like, it was her that got us into the idea of homeschooling. It was her that got us into the idea of anti-vax. It was her that got into all, yeah. a lot of things were kind of her and me just going, okay, sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, that's you how, 
that's how it was with me and Andrew. Like he knows I'm going to dig in and do all this crazy research on that stuff. And then I come to him and I go, look at what I found. And what do you think about this? And he's generally, he's mostly the same way. He's like, yeah, like on these things, I trust your judgment. It sounds like you've done your homework and it sounds reasonable to me. So let's give it a shot. You know, it's kind of how it went. Yeah. Yeah. So how has this all ended now? How, how what have the results been of feminism? Well, by every metric you would probably use to assess people's well-being, happiness. I know these terms are somewhat arbitrary and somewhat subjective, but things that you would look at if you're trying to quantify how well society is doing. Overall, it's not very good. Uh, we have a whole bunch of things like, um, you know, I think in 1960 in America, less than 5% of women with children school age or younger were working outside the home. Now that number is like 40 something percent. It was like 41% a few years ago. I think it's a little higher now. Although some women are starting to do remote work from home, which is better. Um, you have sky high rates of divorce, uh, dropping marriage rates. Um, you have about one in three women having an abortion at some point in their life. You have 25% of women on some kind of psychological you know, psych drug, prescription drug of some kind, uh, highest rates of alcoholism in women that we've ever seen, including uh, prenatal, like fetal alcohol syndrome babies have been on the rise for years. Wow. Um, another funny stat is people assume, there was this bogus stat that a women's group put out in the 70s that something like, it was something ridiculous, like half of women that go to the ER are there for injuries they think happened in a domestic dispute. Turns out that was baloney and the actual number is less than one half of 1% of women who go to the ER are there for that reason. But about half of the women who end up in the ER with a random injury, it's got something to do with alcohol. So there's that. Um, we see women living longer than ever, but being lonelier than ever. There's an epidemic of loneliness on both sides because we've had a war of the sexes and now people are growing into their old age alone with nobody to take care of them. And we have such low birth rates that there aren't enough people to take care of them either. So countries like Canada and Japan are now promoting assisted suicide for the elderly because there's no one to take care of these people. Um, yeah, birth rates have been well below replacement for, what, 50 years now in the in the whole world now. There's only a few areas. I think some parts of Africa and India still have above replacement birth rates. Everybody else is below worldwide. So that's not good. Um, and then we see, uh, I mean, like male suicide rates are really high. Children is probably some of the worst stats are regarding kids. Um, in the literature, children's depression, anxiety, things like that were were so rare in the literature that they were kind of referred to as like a bizarre anomaly that that you would only see under really in crazy circumstances. Now it's incredibly common. Like uh, in my book, I cite some statistics about the number of kids who are on uh, some type of ADHD drug, an anti-anxiety drug, an anti-depression drug. Uh, it's incredibly high. Um, so just if you look at, if you just try to assess <laughs> what was supposed to be this wonderful thing that liberated women, it's like, we don't seem like we're doing so good. You know what I mean? Like overall, like metrics of happiness and well-being are pretty bad. The obesity rate is sky high. Diabetes, heart disease, chronic illness, cancer, all through the roof. Now, you can't say all of these things are directly caused by feminism. Some of them you can. Other things, maybe you can't, but it all kind of correlates together because there's no aspect of modern life that feminism has not touched. Nothing. Like, in, I opened the book with that. If you ever sit down and really think about it, everything you think of from, uh, who's your boss at work, to um, how schools are run, to how governments are run, to how public policy is made, to, um, you know, how, how governments spend money, the amount of debt. I mean, feminism and the women's vote came in tandem with income tax being instituted and the Federal Reserve and all these kind of things as well. So, like, nothing happens in a vacuum and all these things are tied together and you couldn't have 
these things without feminism. You couldn't have these things without the women's vote. For instance, if tomorrow the 19th Amendment was repealed, you would see a shrinking of the welfare state. You would see probably less hawkish foreign policy. Surprisingly, surprisingly, you would actually probably see less hawkish foreign policy from the U.S. government because a lot of women are surprisingly like pro-war neocon types um, because they're safety oriented. Women want safety and security. So things like uh, the surveillance state, the Patriot Act, you know, all of this legislation that got passed here after a certain thing happened in 2001, you couldn't have gotten all that through without women because men are more likely to take risk and and think about like the long-term ramifications of these things. So ironically, if you are a person who loves freedom and democracy, I'm not a particularly so much of a democracy enjoyer myself, but let's say you are and you are behind women's suffrage because you want max freedom and liberty, well, then you're working against your own interests because once women get the vote, Within a century, you have a police state, a nanny state. You have less freedom than you've ever had. And in 2020, we saw that. Everything everything was allowed to be shut down. Everything was allowed to be um, certain, certain measures were passed without any public vote, without any referendum, without even consulting like the people who are supposed to represent us in government. And you saw women coming out as the main enforcers of these policies because my safety, they want, they want safety and security. So by having women vote, you're going to necessarily have tyranny and less liberty. So just something to think about for my liberty minded friends out there. Yeah. Interestingly, you were saying about the, um, the hawkishness, you know, I don't know if they still do it anymore. I actually want somebody to tell me at some point, do they still do this? But in Ireland, when I was a kid in primary school, we call it primary school, you guys call it elementary school, we would do mm -hmm. like Irish mythology and legends and we would have to learn all these legends. And they're kind of tied in with things that they think might be historical events, but they're not sure. And there's this kind of mix of myth and reality. And um, the more warlike chieftains that we had in our ancient past, a lot of them well, a few of them certainly were, were were our female chieftains that we had. And that's just kind of like standard understood part of Irish mythology, right? So it's yeah. just like, it's maybe less surprising <laughs> if you're if you're educated in that kind of thing. Yeah, I don't think, I think, well, you always hear like silly stuff from people now, like, oh, if women ran the world, there would be no war. And it's like, have you met women? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> maybe as a woman, you haven't had to deal with them, but they're, they're passive aggressive. You know, they tend to be more passive aggressive, which lends itself to things like having a deep state and a security state and a surveillance state and a welfare state. And if you look at the number of out of wedlock births from 1950 to now, and you look at welfare spending rates and you adjust it for inflation and you put it on a graph, it goes like this, totally perfectly in tandem with each other. I mean that we've just replaced fathers with the state. And of course the state wants that. So when people go, well, why, why would men want to give women suffrage? Well, if you're um, some of these industrial elites who ran everything at the beginning of the 20th century, of course you'd want women voting. You get women out of the house working, which we, we went from women being like 10% of the workforce in 1940 to being half the workforce by 1988. That's like 40 years. Wow. You've doubled the workforce, um, which does depress men's wages to a certain degree. Um, and then that also gets moms out of the home and well, the kids have to go somewhere. So where do the kids go? They go to a state subsidized daycare. Or they go to a public school where the state can indoctrinate them for eight hours a day with whatever they want. And uh, one thing that did happen in 2020, when uh, everything got closed down and all the schools got closed down, a lot of moms, number one, realized they kind of like being home with their kids. And it was kind of nice to not have to like do the rat race every day and drop them off at daycare. And then they got to learn like some things that were going on with their kids that they didn't know and what they were learning in school and what they weren't learning in school. And they were kind of mm -hmm. shocked about that. And so we've seen a really steep rise in homeschooling in the United States since 2020 since that happened. That's the article I wrote that ended up getting me on Tucker Carlson because 
yeah, it was like, it really showed a lot of the inherent flaws in the way that we've been doing things for so long. Everybody had to take this giant pause and like think about stuff, which we are normally too busy to do. But yeah, I mean, I just think that uh, if you want to double your income tax base and you want a security state and you want this massive surveillance nanny state and a welfare state and all these things, uh, what better way to get there than to tell all the women they have to vote because, you know, you don't want to be oppressed. You don't want to be oppressed, do you? Make sure you go out and vote. <laughs> Jer just said, uh, I'd work for a man any day, but not a woman. Unfortunately, I did that and would never again. Edward Dutton, I think, talks about that, that the, act the, the fastest way to make more women rise up through the ranks is to have a man at the top because women will not promote other women. That's true. We are too competitive. So men work in hierarchies. Men are used to cooperating and they're accepting of hierarchy. Like men, if you get a bunch of men in a room, they figure out the pecking order pretty quick. Um, mm -hmm. But in like a more friendly, cooperative way, like my husband always says, men know how to be friends. <laughs> <laughs> Women don't. Um, and it's kind of true. And it's because we are competing for the best men. We're competing for resources for our future offspring. So we tend to be pretty competitive with each other for better or worse. We can cooperate as well, but you do see women become more cooperative like once they all already have kids and are married and stuff like that. Um, like hormonally, there's reasons why that would be and psychologically and practically there's reasons why that would be. But <clears throat> that's why women are always middle managers. That's why they're always trying to get the top CEOs to all be women, which first of all, women are miserable. Like Jordan Peterson has had a ton of data. You know, he, he's wrong about a lot, but he's right about quite a lot too. And one of the things he was right about was if you look at women who are at the top of any field, they're pretty miserable. They tend to suffer from a lot of neuroses and psychological problems and depression and and are pretty miserable. Women aren't really built for that. We're not built to be heads of giant law firms or to be senators and things like that. Do you occasionally throughout history have a tiny small pool of women who are just built different and maybe can do that? Yeah, I guess. But so what? Like, why, why should we change the way everything works because of that? There's always exceptions to the rule. It doesn't mean you change the rule. So Yeah, like there's men out there who can't handle being a soldier there's men out there who can't handle the, you know that doesn't mean you don't you, you have yeah. no men in the army because those men can't handle it right so why do we do the reverse yeah well i think historically too that's why the simp problem was kept under control because historically men died young like uh you'll see in the in the genetic record that more than twice as many women have been able to reproduce as men so like only 40 percent of men who were ever born got to pass on their genetic code, 80% of women who were ever born. And a large part of that is because men were always the ones that had to go off and die in wars. I mean, look at World War I, how many men died. Like France had like a almost no men left. And like a lot of the French women had to marry like German guys or British guys or things like that. There's been a lot of times throughout history where like you'd have mass die-offs of male populations because of things like war. Men are always the ones that are out there being the cannon fodder. So I think maybe a lot of like weaker men would have been purged. I'm not saying that's good. I'm not saying I'm for that. I'm just saying like a lot of the guys who may end up resorting to simpery as a mating strategy probably didn't make it. You know what yeah. I mean? Whereas yeah. now, now what do we have? Now we have single moms with sons and they raise the son like it's their like it's their husband. You guys are aware of that weird dynamic, right? Where you have a single mom who's got a boy and he's the man of the house and she calls him her king and all that kind of cringe stuff. So, and this is, I run into this all the time on social media. Um, I told Andrew, I was texting him to have like, ask that guy, the guy who was saying he wanted his mom to be an OnlyFans model. I said, ask him if he's got a single mom. So finally Andy found a, a an opening and said, do you have a single mom? And the guy was like, well, yes, I do. And she is brave and stunning and beautiful. And it's like every time, every time somebody comes at me, I go, do you have a single mom? And they're like, well, yes, I do. And my mom worked 10 jobs and she's amazing. And she's a superhero. And I'm like, uh-huh. Okay. This is, but this is why, this is why you have this problem. I feel like. Yeah. And women traditionally would have been br more brutal with those kind of guys, more, uh, 
you know, more dismissive of those kinds of guys. And I, I, I even yeah. just with the war reference got reminded of, I don't know if this is, I'm pretty sure this is true, but in, I think in Scandinavian countries or in certainly in one of the Scandinavian countries, and um, when they were at, when they were having battles, the women would stand on the back line and any man that tried to flee the battle, the women would slaughter him. Yeah. Because if, because if they lost, <clears throat> like they, they were all getting raped later. So they were like, yes. you're going to keep fighting. You, you don't get to run away, you know, and they literally kill the guys if they tried to run away. Yeah. Um. Since we're since I'm just a, a, what's the American slur? What's a insult you use for Americans? Do you oh, have a yank. bad name for us? Say yank. Okay. Since I'm a dirty yank, I will tell you <laughs> one of my favorite rock bands is a British band called The Darkness, and they actually have some really cool songs about like when the Vikings would pillage England back in the day and take all the women and stuff like that. <laughs> it's a real. I love that band. I know I'm such a nerd, but um, I I'm a huge fan of theirs and. I actually like learned some some British history through some of their songs. I know that's so cringe, but but yeah, I can be cringe sometimes and be a fangirl <laughs> too, you know. Yeah, they're great. I remember that they, they they struck the scene so big. That's the the high pitched voice. Yes, um, Justin guy, right? Hawkins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember they were massive for like a year or two. Yeah, like, like back like 2007, 2006, something like that. Like their debut. Um, album was huge everywhere but they have a really great song catalog and he's probably one of the best like rock singers and guitar players that's alive right now he's really? like incredible okay. yeah he's su they're vastly underrated but super talented band um but yeah that's just uh there there's my piece of and i'm half irish my mother's whole side of the family comes from ireland and my mom has done all of the like historical record tracking and she said that our our Irish ancestors came here in 1865 from County Limerick. Don't know where it is, but that's that's what she tells me. So <laughs> that's half, close, of, half pretty, Irish. Pretty, pretty close to where, where Rua, in one of my moderators, is from. Um, yeah, because I actually I remember how upset Andrew was. He was making fun of Irish people and he was saying he's only half Irish. And then he and then he mentioned that you were half Irish. And I was like, Well, then your kids are more Irish than anything else. And he was, Yes, he they was, are. He uh -huh. was quite disappointed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's like half Irish and then the rest is mostly English. And I think there's a little bit of something else in there. And then my dad's like full Dutch, so I'm half Irish, half Dutch. So I don't know what it's like half of me wants to uh, be like a Dutch reformed teetotaler and the other half of me wants to be an alcoholic. So I just think it balances itself out. So your week, I can your, have fun, but yeah, your weekends are crazy, but yeah. your weeks are really, your weekdays are pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was great growing up because we would go to like my dad's side of the family first on holidays, and it would be like coffee and like ham sandwiches and like uh reading from the Bible and playing the organ. It was so conservative. And then we go to my mom's house later because it was like all my uncles sitting around a table just doing shots and watching the horse track race. And my my Welsh aunt and my Irish aunt literally like fist fighting each other, like getting into physical fights with one another. <laughs> and it was just like wild and loud and crazy. So it was totally opposite. It's totally opposite. Shocker so that my parents didn't stay married, really. <laughs> Who could have seen that coming? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, like I think um, I think I, I, I've heard, I've seen um, some of these Irish American families, and it did, didn't occur to me because I was sharing some funny videos with people on Instagram, some Americans that I've kind of connected with, and uh, they're like, "Oh, those women look like like of Irish women doing something. They look like women in my local town here." You know, like it's funny. I think I think some Irish Americans really stayed quite Irish, and that never occurred to me until quite recently. Yeah, um, it's not as much now, but like when I was growing up, my mom's side lived in like the Irish part of town, like in the city they were from there. Well, they were originally from Chicago and there was like the Irish little neighborhood and then the Polish neighborhood was right next to it. Um, and so my grandma had like some Polish recipes she'd get from the, the Polish people in her neighborhood or whatever. But yeah, they all kind of stuck near each other and like all of, that's why I'm like full half. My mom is like 98.9% .9 like Irish and all of the names are Irish. It's like the most Irish names you've ever heard. Everyone's named Thomas, Edward, or Mary. 
you know, and all of the last names are like really Irish last names. I don't want to dox my whole family, so I won't say them, but. Because we know yeah. the first names now, so all we have to do is get the surnames. And we've well, got that's all. the thing is, like, with <laughs> Irish people, aren't all of us named, like, uh, Edward, Thomas, Mary? They're all named some kind of Catholic, like, name for the most part. Yeah, At least in my family, they are. John and Michael and, yes, yeah. So. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, this has been great. I was, uh, Is there yeah. anything else you'd like to mention? I definitely want to mention anybody who's been enjoying the stream, you know, got to get the book. Yeah, gotta get the get book. The book. Book. It is actually a great book. If you've been like, there's been a lot of people talking about how great this information is, but here it is. You can buy it. It's right yeah, there. you can buy it. <laughs> I'm actually releasing a Spanish version later this week. I got a Spanish translation, so wow. Maybe we can help the Spanish-speaking countries with their feminism problem. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. They don't idea. have as much, but it is definitely creeping in. Like, I actually had a, a lady from Spain reach out to me and say, I want to do this translation. Like, we need it. I want to show this book to everyone I know, but most of them don't know English well enough to read the book. So I would love to do a translation. And I was like, I would be happy for you to do one. So she graciously did. And uh, that'll be out later this week. And then book number two is coming later this summer, and that is going to be my 15 best arguments against feminism. It's not going to be as historic and as um, like uh, religiously, theologically oriented. It's going to just be like the straight arguments that I use with facts, data, sources, so that all the people who want to argue against feminism whether it's, you know, formally or whether they just want to be able to kind of, you know, do an apologetic to their family or to their friends. Because uh, I always say the reason I started doing this is because I had to get really good at defending all my life choices to everyone around me. Everything I did, it was like, even the women around me who are supposed to be conservative Christians were like, concerned, you know, always concerned that I'm doing things this way or, you know, and people had really strong opinions about my marriage that, I thought, I just thought it was so weird. I'm like, he's really nice to me. Why does everyone feel like it's the number one thing? Everyone's like, <laughs> she's in an abusive relationship. I'm like, there's literally nobody on the planet who is nicer to me than Andrew. Like, you have no idea the amount of crap he's put up with from me over the years. And nothing I do, I could have done without his support and his help. I, I really couldn't. That's not an exaggeration. He is very handsome, but I'm not simping. I'm just saying how it is. And he's like, just really a wonderful husband and father. And he gets this terrible rap for being some kind of like abusive man. And I'm like, <laughs> it's so weird to me, but yeah, even women in our own family would be like, well, you should be working. You should be contributing and making money. And uh, don't you worry about not having your own money? What if something happens? Like what if Andrew cheats on you and you don't have your own money? And I'm just like, what? No wonder y'all are divorced. You're like, you're preparing for the divorce. Like your whole marriage is about preparing for the inevitable divorce. Like you're crazy. Um, yeah. So I just got really good at defending that. And um, I get reached out to a lot by people who are like, I want to defend it too, but like I'm, I'm not as articulate or I don't know all the stuff. So this book will have just the straight arguments, the straight facts, tons of sources and citations for anybody who wants to make the case. Okay. And when's the Irish translation coming out? Uh, I have to find someone <laughs> who speaks Ireland. Um, maybe you could help me with that. Maybe um, you and Mrs. Strawberry could produce an Irish translation. Yeah, it would actually Irish be Irish. really funny to hear you like try to read parts of my book, but in like an Irish vernacular with like the little funny words. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I literally mean in like in Irish Gaelic, like, you know, actual oh. Irish. Irish. <laughs> Get it over. It I don't know. That always sounds like funny fairy speak to me. So. It would yeah. probably be really entertaining to like read my book in that. I don't know what it would sound like. Yeah, my yeah, my probably. ancestors are turning in their graves right now. They're like, what? probably really based. I'd say is what it would sound like in Irish. But probably, probably, probably would. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I'm gonna end the broadcast here. What are we on? We're on two hours and thirty four. Wow. Um, so um. Everybody like and subscribe. I'm always saying it. It's quite difficult to get people to like and subscribe to a tiny little channel, but just try your best. Just, 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 just a little button there. Um, and uh, thanks for coming.
Um, this later Absolutely. this week, Saturday, we have Rua on, and one of my moderators, and he is involved with the national the national party over here in Ireland. So we're going to get him talking. Um, That'll be interesting. Yeah. All right, guys. I'm going to end the broadcast. See you later.